Everybody out there, Reaper Nation, how are you tonight? We have a special guest coming on. His name is Jonathan Gilliam, who wrote the book, Sheep No More. As you guys can see right here, get it on the other side, Sheep No More. So what I want you all to do is get your books, because he's going to come on. He's going to talk about his books. He's going to talk about all that stuff. And, um, and we're going to go through the book. We're going to highlight some things to uh, discuss about awareness and being aware and thinking like a criminal or a terrorist or something like that so that you can be safer and uh, your family can be safer. So, uh, you know, he's going to come on pretty soon. Um, <laughs> he's going to be on pretty soon. So that's why I look, you know, I come on at 8, roughly, 8.05, and then he'll come on, you know, at 8.15 or something. Last night, we had a great show with Dave Bray. I want to thank him. Thank you, Dave. You did a great job, and he's a phenomenal person. He really is. He's a great person. I have uh, been around Dave a couple times and uh, just personally been around him, and he's just as nice as could be. He's not arrogant, which, you know, guys get to that level in their careers, with, you know, especially singing or entertaining people. It goes to their head. Um, he's very level-headed, and uh, he's very family-oriented. And, um, of course, we'd have to ask his wife how family-oriented. And, uh, of course, we'd probably get a different answer, but it's all good. But uh, let's see. we got some people checking in. Casey? Casey's checking in. Casey is our CEO with Anteriors Alliance. So if you're not a lifetime Anteriors Alliance person, you must do it. You know, you got to do it. And uh, you get cool things like shirt, coin. But more importantly... You get all these discounts on all the interiors product line that's uh, you know being sold, and you get to come to our events and not pay a thing when you come. So um, it's a great deal to be part of the interiors. You don't have to have a company do it. It's an individual sponsorship. It's a lifetime membership. It's one of those things where you know you're giving money so that uh, a group of companies can come together and uh, veteran-owned companies, first responder-owned companies, uh, patriot companies, companies that are you know, for the most part, small, but get to do big things and network and do all kinds of stuff. And you get 20% off all your products and stuff. Casey just posted that up there. I have to look at my notes because Casey, will, as I'm plugging in Terry's, Casey's probably going, <laughs> good, Ron's talking about it. And you're right. Last year, I didn't talk about Interiors Alliance as much towards the end, almost in the Christmas time. One, I was out in the field so much. We were, uh, Eric and I were literally busy filming our show, Reaper Outdoors, Survive the Hunt. That's, you know, what we do. And promoting the ammunition line, which is Reaper Ammunition Line, which is the control chaos. Boom. And we got something new for you all, folks. We actually have copper control chaos coming out. And we have a new uh, 300 blackout. A 300 blackout subsonic round, and we're going to talk about that in detail because I want to educate you on copper bullets because uh, we have brass projectiles. Like right now, if you look in this box of, of ammunition, the Control Chaos is a, br a brass round. So being that it's brass, it's illegal to manufacture brass projectiles for a pistol because they think that it's an AP. AP round, um, <laughs> armor piercing is what AP stands for. And I'm going to tell you something right now. This is not armor piercing by no means. And I'm going to do that video and prove that to you. This is a killing round. This is about going out and killing animals and protecting yourself. So, I, you know, the ATF and some of the other... And, you know, Jonathan talks about it more than I do. I don't know the in, ins and outs of these agencies and and how, you know, how they think about, and they're on the other side, meaning the other side of anti-gun and anti-Second anti, anti -Second Amendment and, uh, you know, with uh, a lot of liberal views. I don't know the ins and outs of that. I just know what I hear just like you. And there's two sides to every bit of that story. I just like the common sense part. And the common sense part to me is, an ammunition piece that goes out there works. Um, especially if you're a hunter, you want a clean killing round. That's one. Two, you know, if you're home, you want a round that's going to, you know, you hit somebody with it that you have to defend yourself with. You want them to go down. You don't want to wound them or just poke holes in them. I'm going to tell you right now, everybody was all about this green tip crap. We use green tip overseas in Afghanistan 
and in Iraq, I don't know how many times I've seen it in human beings where the uh, green tip goes in and comes right out. Just all it is is a piercing through the. Now, there is a tungsten penetrator uh, that's inside that green tip. What that originally was for, and there's a debate about this, but I remember when it came out, it really what that green that, that thing was for was to stabilize that round because a, uh, a 223 round is very small and has a habit of tumbling, especially out of uh, fully automatic weapons. The hotter that weapon gets, the more tumbling you're getting. Now, I don't care if it tumbles in a terrorist. I don't care about that. The problem about tumbling is it's, un- it's not accurate. So you're not going to hit your targets that you're aiming at if you got a round that's tumbling out there because it's going all over the place before it even hits anything. And if it does hit something, it's going to be sporadic. It's not doing what that bullet's designed to do. So we're going to do some videos about that. Um, the other cool thing we have is we just, you know, revamped the Reaper YouTube. Now, if you haven't gone there, people, this is a whole channel, a whole network. This is Reaper Outdoors. How-to videos how to do something, uh, survival, hunting, and uh, uh, and uh, tactics, um, how to conceal weapons, that's on there. 1791, using their holsters, but instead of just going, oh, it's the best holster in the world, because that's what people do. When I get a sponsor, right, I'm not going to sit here and go, oh, it's the best holster in the world. You know, 1791 is the best, because they're paying me to say that. Native. Now, 1791 is a sponsor of Reaper Outdoors. They pay for advertising on our show. But I will not allow anybody to sponsor Reaper Outdoors if it's not a good quality product. And I haven't tested it, evaluated it, and checked it out. And that is not just the fact that it's about the the gear itself. It's also the company. What is that company like? So we make friends, and then we have sponsors. So it's not a big turnaround. I've, I've been... Uh, fortunate to be able to turn down some some of uh, the big names in the industry just because they wanted me to, you know, say, oh, this is the best everything. You know, a gun company should not make clothing, right? And uh, a clothing company should not make guns. I mean, stay in your lane and do it, but uh, you know, there's certain spots and certain things in the world, especially when it comes to sponsorships, you see a lot of crap out there. I talk about products that are already been sponsored. The companies don't even know who I am. And it's a product that I have. So it's all in that YouTube channel. So go to the Reaper Outdoors YouTube channel. Now, there's two of them out there. It's kind of confusing. I've got to get with Eric. Eric, if you're listening tonight, we got to do something about that second one. There's only like 70-some people subscribe to it. I don't know where it's from and where it's going, the whole nine yards. Sorry, I'm getting distracted. I got a little noise that happened over by my door, but it was my printer. It's acting up. I'm about ready to shoot it. I just might. I might just shoot it. Anybody want to shoot a printer? <laughs> I do. I want to shoot that printer so bad. Anyways. So, back to products. So, products. I am not one to believe that I'm just going to get paid and say, hey, this is the best stuff on the market. I've got a product for you right now that I'm going to show you. Now, remember, Jonathan Gilliam is going to be on here pretty soon, so stay on here. I want to see that number go up. I want to see the numbers, bing, 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 going up. Get your questions ready. We're going to talk about sheep no more. And we're going to spend a good hour, hour and a half on that. So make sure make sure you stay on here and you share this. This is something that's important. You're not going to get this from anywhere else. You got two Navy SEALs, myself and Jonathan. Also, he was an air marshal and he was FBI. So he's got these backgrounds that are just phenomenal. And he was a carpenter before that. You know, he's a guy that got his degree, was a carpenter, and then uh, wanted to be a Navy SEAL. And uh, he happened to show up where I was to get a test. And I just walked out one day, and I was in shorts and T-shirt. And, of course, I was in great shape then. I'm like, who the F are you? You want to be a SEAL? All right. See what you can do. He took the test. He passed. Can't complain about that. Good job. See you later. You know, and fast forward a couple of years later, I'm actually, he gets through buds and all his training and OCS, becomes an officer, which he should have been become a, an enlisted man. That's what he should have done. But he rolled right into, uh, I was at SEAL Team 4, and there just happened to be, I happened to be in between trips and, uh, and running land warfare at the time. And I uh, somebody asked me if I wanted to sit on the board. And it's, uh, yeah, you're going to sit on the board because you want to 
see who the new guys are, and you also want to test them. You want to evaluate. You got to check this. We always talk about smart. To be in the elite forces, SEAL teams, SAW forces, Rangers, to be that and, and to have a career doing that, you have to be smart. Believe it or not, you have to have smart. You just aren't a thug going through a door killing people because there's so much more to it. There's technology involved. I mean, I laugh when Eric thinks I can't do something, but I can't. It's just my job right now is to blah, 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 blah. You know, a lot of talking, shooting, practicing, getting in shape, and uh, driving my company where it needs to go. And, of course, I'm on a computer half the freaking time, and I hate it. But it's a, uh, it's a lesser of two evils. So, anyway, so Jonathan Gilliam is going to be on tonight. you got our experiences coming at you from, you know, what he wrote in that book. So get your questions ready. And as you listen to us, you know, ask questions. If you didn't read the book, you could still ask questions. This is going to save your life. This is going to might save somebody in your family. Think about your children. You know, if you have children, think about your parents. Think about your brothers, your sisters, and your friends. And there's an event coming up, and you're all going to this event, and it's going to be great. It's a family reunion, and we're going to go to this concert. We're going to go to this show. We're going to go to this race. We're going to go to this beautiful monument. Uh, we're going to go to D.C. We're going to go somewhere. And there's going to be a crowd of people. Well, guess what, folks? You've got to know what to do if something happens. You don't have to run around scared. Don't do that. Enjoy your life, but just be aware. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to bring you through the awareness thought process. This can be awesome. So we're getting people in here uh, saying stuff. So like I said, <clears throat> one of the things that I really enjoy, I keep my eye on my phone in case Jonathan texts me again. He's uh, he's going to be coming on pretty soon. He's, he's doing something, getting something ready. So I talked to you just real quick about 1791 and how we how we became friends. But the YouTube videos really struck me when uh, we did our uh, evaluation of these, and then we did a YouTube video on them. And then uh, later on, uh, we became friends and, and partners in the fact that they are actually uh, designing a Reaper holsters right now. So it's more than just sponsoring. It's uh, business. And it's good quality stuff where I put, you put your life on your line. When you put a holster on your belt or on your back, on your pack, in your pack, on your chest, anywhere, you have a holster. That weapon is going to be stored in that holster. You got to be able to get to it. You got to make sure it's secure. You got to make sure it's safe. You got to make sure that that holster, that thing functions. This becomes, once that weapon's involved with this right here, and this is out of the package, this becomes a life essential product. It really does. Holsters are that important. And I have several different types of holsters for different things. Now, I wouldn't go scuba diving with a leather holster. No. I wouldn't go, uh, you know, running into a uh, battle without a secure holster to hold that in there, right? So different holsters do different things. But I sure would wear their holsters, and I do all the time. They have several holsters, really soft leather that separates your skin from the weapon or your shirt from your belt. Very important things to think about. And that's what holsters are designed to do. And leather is a very durable product, obviously. It looks cool, too, you know, so if you're in for the look. But uh, so, yeah, they're a sponsor. They pay for ad time. They pay. They sponsor for that. But one thing that our sponsors sign up for, too, is a partnership. I mean, I'm going to help them out all I can. And I'm, I'm a salesman. I'm going to tell you buy this stuff because it works. I use it myself. It's not like an infomercial where they, oh, this thing, you know, coat the bottom of a boat. And it'll float. Yeah, freaking coat it with Vaseline. It'll float long enough to do what they do with it. I mean, that's simple, right? That's physics. So I bring up 1791 for the reason that, you know, and a SEAL 1 is another product, which I'm looking around, and I had moved the table out of here, so I don't have anything in reach. Do I? Damn, no. All right, so SEAL 1, everybody knows, is a uh, a product of ours. And, uh, and we also have the Reaper SEAL 1 kit. So there's that partnership development. Also, SEAL 1 is going to start, they're selling Reaper ammunition. I'm leaving tomorrow morning for NBS show in Dallas. I'm going to be with SEAL 1 selling Reaper ammo and SEAL 1. I'm not there just to sell Reaper ammunition, control chaos. People go, go to the store and get it. I'm going to also sell SEAL 1. And you're going to see this partnership develop. And you're going to see why. And you go to our YouTube. You subscribe to it. We need, I think we need 200 more people. And so please push that. All right. 
So while I got your attention, I am going to talk right now about a product that you may or may not have heard of. They are not a sponsor of mine. Hell, I don't even know. They might not even want to know that I even use this because I kill animals and eat them. You would be amazed at uh, the people out there, and it's a very small amount of people, actually, that are just opposed hunters. They think it's horrible that you go out, you kill an animal, you butcher it, you package it, and you feed it to your family, and you eat it. They would much rather have a cow or chicken in an overstocked barnyard, mud. I mean, I've seen these places, people, where your beef comes from. Mine, too. I get steak. And when they pull that, <laughs> that big cow in and that rat closes between their neck while they're all behind each other, sniffing each other's butts, and that bolt goes right through their head, boom, boom, and then they drop while they're still twitching. They're getting washed off. Uh, their hides getting tanned. They're getting ripped open, and everything's going wherever. It's kind of a, it's a really gruesome thing about butchering. When you kill a wild animal, he's all out there in Mother Nature. He's enjoying himself. He's calm, cool, collective. He might be a little scared. Deer will run around, whitetail walk around scared their own shadows. But they're living the life they want to live and they're designed to live. And they're also designed to be prey. You know, carrots aren't on this earth to poison people. Carrots are on this earth to feed people. Prey is on this earth to feed predators. Predators are on this earth to eat prey, but also to turn back into Mother Nature when they die, compose compost into soil and, and nutrition into the soil and so basically the earth eats us after we die and we rot how gross is that huh so it's evolution it's a uh, part of our being is uh eating animals i just think it takes a <laughs> it literally takes a different person a breed to go out and kill your find your own animal kill your own animal Butcher your own animal, respect that animal, of course, and then consume that animal. Because that's where it all starts. We want the deer to stay around. We want the bear to stay around. We want the antelope and the elk and everything we eat. We want them to thrive. We want them to be healthy herds so we can eat them in the end state. You got trophy hunters out there who like the trophy hunt. They'll grab the antlers. As long as that meat's going somewhere, feeding families, uh, feeding homeless people, all that stuff. They're eating better than we are. Yeah, I've heard people actually say, well, they just feed, you know, deer. It's, it's terrible. They feed deer to the homeless shelter. You know, I'm going to go out to a restaurant and buy yourself a venison steak. See how much that costs you. That's a farm-raised deer. There's a lot of legalities. And they probably have some kind of injections on them to stay healthy or prevent them from getting some kind of disease or something. It's the most expensive meat on the planet is wild meat. And if it's feeding the homeless, they're eating the best stuff on the planet. Yes. So I have no trouble with it as long as it all works. As long as you're an ethical hunter and you're an ethical outdoorsman, I'm for it. Of course, I do it myself. But I'm going to talk to you right now about a product that helps me kill animals. It also helps me not scare people off. And that is deodorant. <laughs> So I'm going to show you a deodorant that I use in the field. And this is a secret because uh, not many people talk about deodorants. And when you go out in the woods and you spend, you're spending a week or so out there, man, you got to wash your hygiene. You got to wash your armpits, your neck, you know, uh, your groin, your butt, your feet, you know, your hands, your arms, your neck. I mean, I say the neck because right here you'd be surprised. You know, you got you to gotta wash your neck area. You know, it's exposed a lot of times. So when that scent's blown over, it's right there. And then you got your heater pod, which I call these your heater pods right here. This uh, gets really hot, gets really warm. You got a coat on, you know, you're going to sweat. It's, it's what it is. You get more sweat here. You've got those glands. So with sweat comes bacteria, with bacteria comes scent. And the same with your groin, the same with your feet, you know. Um, and some people have sweaty feet and some people don't. But I'll tell you, if you do, a friend of mine, he had uh, terrible Reaper Zero Two. He had... Uh, we would have his feet outside the tent. <laughs> you know, he played pro football and everything else. And that's all I'm going to say about that. But, you know, when he went to a doctor and they finally found something that worked and he has no issues now at all. And it was uh, acne medicine for his feet. So if you know somebody that take him to a dermatologist, tell him about acne medicine for feet. I don't know. And, uh, 
Anyways, maybe your uh, husband or wife will quit having stinky feet. So let's move on. Deodorant. So deodorant is a very important thing when you're out in the field. It's important when I'm at a show. It's important when I'm around Charlotte. It's important when I'm around my kids and grandkids. It's important for daily life. And some people go deodorant free. Well, deodorant free means they might not stink after a shower, but after a little while, a little bit of working. And when you're hunting, you're definitely working. Um, even if you're sitting there in the cold, you get your big parka jacket on and you think it's cold outside and you're shaking, but guess what? You're getting, you're toasty warm. That's why you put your hands in here like this. So as long as you do this and don't do this, like baby Reaper used to always do this. You go, I'm like, dude, what are you doing? What are you doing? So here's a deodorant that I use. Bam. They are not a sponsor. So take a close look at this people. All right, simple. See, it's unscented deodorant essentials. Um, I'm going to tell you why I like them. There's a couple reasons. In the hunting world today, the reason you won't see me marketing deodorant that are made for hunters is because all it is is scent-free chalk. It's a grimy chalk. It sucks. You spend 4 or $5 because the word hunting deodorants on there and you put it on it doesn't freaking work anyway and basically what it does it stops you from completely sweating and everything that's what deodorant does okay deodorant does that it's helped it's a, it helps you stop sweating so i mean you can put deodorant on your feet i've known people that have deodorant sticks and put them on their feet so they don't sweat as much you know i guess there's some runners that do that and that's why they use powders powders uh you know, for that stuff. But when you're a hunter, you're not going to be out there putting deodorant on your feet, your groin, your, all this stuff, and anywhere you want to put it, right? You can't. Don't get me wrong. But the stuff that's out there right now, the scent-free deodorants that you buy at a sporting goods store, maybe some sporting goods stores that carry ammo is not going to like what I got to say. They're just robbing you right now of money. And it's not just about the money. It's about the quality. They're terrible quality. Terrible. Terrible quality. If I could actually get Armor Hammer to put the Reaper logo on there, this is what I would sell on the market because you know why? It works. It absolutely works. So if somebody's allergic to deodorants, somebody's, uh, this is uh, one of those neutral deodorizers, which means that uh, it, can, it contains Armor Hammer baking soda, you know? And uh, if you're a hunter and you pay lots of money, for and I do it. I do. I actually I pick up some scent sprays. I pick up uh, you know the uh, the soap that's uh, you know scent free. It actually helps because there is some chemicals in there. But uh, the basics of it, Armor Hammer actually is a baking soda. And baking soda literally helps with scents, and you can wash your clothes in baking soda, just straight up baking soda, and it's scent free. Just make sure it's unscented. But that's the key. So when you're out in the field and I'm doing my thing, like even now I have this on. I took my shower. I took two showers today, one in the morning and put it on. And one, uh, um, I don't know, probably 11 o'clock or so after my workout. And uh, and right there is what I'm using. And it works great. And now, so what you can do, what I like to do actually is, and I'll show you what this looks like. I don't like the white pasty stuff. I like the clear stuff, and this is what it is. It's clear. I don't know if you can see that very well. It's very clear. So, and don't uh, rub your lips with it because you'd be. And literally, you know, you, there's a, you know, some clean. It smells clean. It doesn't stink. It doesn't smell like perfumes or anything like that. So, if you're, uh, so that's one of the tricks about scent, and I know that wasn't written in there, but this is the kind of videos I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be talking to you about this. Now, I'm not going to be standing out there putting deodorant on for you because I don't have to show you how to do that. I mean, I could. There is a technique to put deodorant on. I don't know if you taught your children that. You should. You know, you see kids, you know, they don't know if you're wearing black, you know, to put it on and put your shirt on right away, and you get these little streaks that are right here, and that's from certain deodorants, right? And you guys know that. You know, when you put your shirt over your head and connects and then just got this deodorant streaks on there well you won't have that with this with this there's nothing to it there's really nothing to this so this is the deodorant that i use 
We have some video. I'm going to do that video. I'm going to talk more in depth about it. And that's why you need to go to the Reaper YouTube channel. But they aren't a sponsor of mine. But it's a product that freaking works. And I love it. And I'll tell you what, a cost, 4 or $5 at a hunting store for the stuff that and it breaks in half. You never get to use it all anyway. This, you can use every bit of it because it's got a really good holding case. It also, uh, I wonder if it'll catch on fire. I don't think it should. It shouldn't. I should have a lighter with me, but I don't think I do. Hmm. I, I would catch anything on fire. Anybody want to see deodorant burn? <laughs> if I had a lighter right here, I would. I'm amazed I don't have a lighter in tow, but eh, I don't think it'll start anyway. Maybe it will. It might be alcohol in here. Um, anyways, so when it comes to deodorant, make sure you use scent-free stuff, and, and especially Mother Nature. I don't care if you're taking pictures. If you're going for a hike in the woods, here's another trick. If you're going for the hike in the woods, you're in the mountains, especially up in uh, Montana or out west, you know, where they have grizzly bears and all that. One thing you don't want to do uh, is wear something fruity, ladies, you know, like you like smelling like roses and fruit and all that good stuff. And even some guys out there that like smelling like a girl for some reason. If you do, guess what? You're attracting animals. Yes. And you're going to attract a predator. He's going to go because bears are curious. Predators are curious about scents. So, uh, you know, you don't have to be a hunter and a killer to go out and have a, you know, scent-free load. You just need to, you know, be smart about it. And, uh, you know, so even hiking, you know, be smart about it. You're, uh, you're hiking, you need it. Um, believe me, there was times in Afghanistan where we could use a lot of deodorant. We had, uh, we spent over a month in the field and not one time did we shower. Now we did get to bathe in a Creek, you know, a couple of times you get to a Creek and you, but you always got to watch out for that because they, they crap on their, I'm not lying. So what the Haji does is they crap in their house and they have like a hole in the bottom on their floor with a, uh, a groove that goes outside of their house. And they've been, they've been doing this for thousands and thousands, as long as human beings been out there. And then they just go out to the creek and get some water, flush it out. Well, it goes out into a drain. It goes right back to that creek. That's where they get their, they wash their clothes, their dishes. That's where they, I don't know, you know, if they brush their teeth. I'm sure they do something. Uh, maybe not. But that's where they get their drinking water. So, you know, there was one time when we thought we were, well, man, there ain't no village up there. That's, you know, so I literally, we dunked in that water. We took, you know, had a perimeter set up and we got in that water and we cleaned up. Oh, it felt so good, you know, and you get done and you're a bunch of team guys with a gun and ace gear running around naked trying to dry off and then get back in your clothes. And then the next group of guys would come in and, and uh, what you had was, um, when the guys went up, we had some guys go up and they said, man, you guys aren't going to believe us on the radio. These guys uh, are crapping right in the stream. And at first we thought they were kidding, but they weren't. There was actually a village a little ways up. Same thing. All their dreams went right back. But I'll tell you what, it still felt great. I don't care. You know, it's uh, one of those things where try not bathing for a while and see what happens. I've, I've done a couple weeks in the mountains around uh, in, here in the United States. <coughs> and uh, just living in the field and you know you've got to get in the stream so you've got to get in the lake you've got to clean up and that's the thing so just hygiene is so important when you're in the field um so and another little trick for people out there if you're a deer hunter or a uh, hunter in general uh, when it comes to smells is your your clothing we talked about your gear but don't forget about your weapon you know, there is nothing like going out. I've done it. I've, I've done it when I was young. Um, you go out in the field, then all of a sudden you're putting some kind of lubricant or oil all over your gun. You're putting some kind of oil or something all over your bow and the cams, you know, the metal parts. That's just ridiculous. That's why I like Seal One. Seal One actually uh, has a scent to it when you apply, and then it dissipates, which means it goes away. So your gun does not smell. Um, your bow does not smell. And uh, that's another advantage point of using seal one. Uh, that 
as a cleaner lubricant protecting all one, but it doesn't, you don't walk around out there smelling like a freaking oil factory, you know? So, and, um, you know, definitely clean. I told you about the spots you got to clean, you know, we'll, we'll get more into that in the video, but, uh, Jonathan Gilliam's coming on here right shortly. Bam with sheep no more. And we're going to talk about it. And, uh, you guys just keep holding on. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming real soon. Oh, I bet you guys like know what's on this paper, huh? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you. These are secret pricings from Reaper Outdoors for all your dealers. This is what the uh, NBS show is getting this week down in, in Dallas. I'll be down there with Seal One. We're going to actually, uh, like I said, be selling our products to stores all over the United States. And hopefully we have many, many buyers. But uh, what I really heard was you sit there at your table. You got your products. You got your PO sheets. Your purchase order sheets, that's what that is, actually. And um, you just sit there, and dealers walk by you with their head down. They walk by everybody. And then they come back later, and they just fill it out, and they go, because they don't, you know, it's, yeah, whatever. Yeah, you want to walk by the booth with your head down? Go ahead. I don't care. You know, um, go. <laughs> Maybe you and I don't want to do business together, you know. Uh, anyways, and I can understand some of it, because you just get grabbed by people. Hey. I know at SHOT Show, when you walk by some of those booths, uh, you know, and I, I'm, I'm looking at things, but the last thing you want to make do is make eye contact with somebody behind a table because they're like, oh, you're interested. Hey. I mean, I'll see that. And I'll see people stop, and I'll look at the gel blocks, and they'll be, hmm. And, uh, and I'll go, all I ask is, can I help you? And they're like, no, I'm just looking. Oh, okay. And then you start a little small talk, and maybe they will. You know, um, that's happened where a couple of buyers just kind of looked and then you engage with them. And next thing you know, they're talking to them and they're like, yeah, you know what? They take a, a sheet, and give you a card and they say, send me a electronically and boom, you do. And you don't hear from them for about six weeks. Next thing you know, out of nowhere comes an order. That's happened to us uh, already from SHOT Show. <coughs> and uh, it's like, all right, cool. You know, I'm all about it. You know, you want, I don't care if you were today or a year from now, but. Anyways, um, we talked about uh, we talked about deodorant and uh, and all that good stuff. The other thing is uh, we're getting ready to talk to Jonathan Gilliam about awareness. Why why was this important for me and all of the Reaper fans is because you know I, I, I've done programs and I've been in places in the world where I came home and I was literally um, looking around every corner, clearing corners when I walked through the doors. You know. Uh, you know, uh, just walk around, not scared, but so over aware that I wasn't enjoying anything. I would go to a club or a bar or someplace and just kind of get back and stand there like I was a bouncer. People would come up and go, are you a bouncer? I'm like, no, but I would just, I didn't have fun in there anymore, you know, uh, cause of the crowd of people and then all the dangers you got, you know, a bunch of drunk people hanging out, yelling, screaming and having fun. And then you always got those yahoos in there who think they're big badasses and they just want to start a fight or, they bump in you and they give you that mean look. And uh, one thing I learned was to be aware is, you know, have your outs. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. So that's what a lot of this book entails is, you know, planning, you know, like mission planning. You know, he calls it like mission planning, but it's really uh, a big part of it is not so much mission planning as it is. It's not like you're going on a mission, but life is a mission. And that's what we sense it to. So I think it's pretty cool that Jonathan's going to do this with us tonight. So I tell you what, everybody, grab your books. Sheep no more. As you can see, I got some stuff in here. I got even my questions. And uh, if you got any questions, please bring it up. So we're going to bring Jonathan on here in a couple seconds. So uh, he's actually in the lobby right now. I literally have a lobby. That's where I put everybody. Everybody goes in the lobby. I would say green room, but they, unless they bring something to drink or have something to drink at their place, I got nothing for you. So if you're in my lobby, though, I'd have all kinds of stuff for you. But you'd have to drink out of Steeler glasses. <laughs> so we'll get started with Jonathan, and I want to thank everybody. Make sure you're sharing this. Make sure you're liking it. Um, let me see what we got. If we got anything that I talked about so far, I can answer, and we can get off of it and get going. Membership is a no-brainer and benefits everybody. That's Sarah for Anteriors Alliance. So become a life member, people. I live that every day in the banking world. Yep, all polit political. So 
The, okay, Jeremiah, what's up? And uh, Jennifer's on there. Sarah's on there. Matilda's on there. Uh, we got a lot of Sarah on here as always. Awesome. Ben, what's up, Ben? How you doing, my friend? Um, Alan's on here. And everybody's saying hello. Ann's on here. Doug's on here. Um, too many steroids in meat today. Well, you know, it's true, but they also backed off a lot of that as well. So uh, they really did. I know a lot of the farmers and ranchers out west, and they kind of, you know, they, they did. They blocked off a lot of that. Now it's more natural beef because they're getting more money for it. And that's a good thing for the food sources in the world. Still, it's not perfect, but it's as good as you can get for mass production of beef, right? I wash clothes and baking soda. Yeah, that's really good. That's good stuff to do. Don't smell like anything they want to eat. Dan, your app, that's a badass babe right there. She does a lot of stuff up in Grizzly Land, her and her husband. And uh, I'll tell you what, when you're walking around out there, you got to you gotta be smart about how you smell. Even though if you're going for a hike, a nature hike, or going fishing, you still got to worry about that stuff. Um, this is, uh, the book in soft cover, oh, cover, uh, soft cover only. Jonathan's going to have to tell us about that. And so James has not finished the book. Could you ask Jake about time, space, slowing down during an attack? Does he think? Yeah, so we'll ask him this question. And um, until like launches in SL at Olympics. Yeah, the Olympics happen right now. So we are uh, – <laughs> Freaking, you know, I think we're doing good out there. I have no idea. But you know what? More importantly, the Olympics is happening cool. And Ben, um, brother, Ben Tyndall, everybody, great man. He's a mentor of mine. I, I, I really he's one of the best salesmen in the whole world. I wish he worked for Reaper Outdoors because uh, I couldn't pay him anything right away. So, Ben, get rich and then come work for us. That's, that's how it works. So, anyways, here we go, folks. We're going to bring on uh, Sheep No More, Jonathan Gilliam. Uh, he's coming on, so I hope he's ready because he lives in New York City. He's all rednecked out tonight. Bam. Boom. There you are, brother. How you What's doing, up, bro? buddy? <laughs> I'm trying to get my show started at the same time just so I could announce it so people could hear you. Um, yeah. I'm having, a little, I'm having a little issue. Go figure. I never have issues, but I'm having an issue tonight. Well, so. that's, that's um, typical. That's, ty- that's yeah. the way it works for everybody. So go ahead. Let's talk. I'll figure this out as we're talking. Oh, you need a little more time? Um, no, let's go ahead. I don't. I'm not going to make your uh, your the people who are watching wait. I, I'll figure it out as we go. That's right. Our numbers went down a little bit. I couldn't hold it. I couldn't hold the. Uh, that's all right. Everybody that much, you know, because they wanted to see Jonathan Gilliam. You know, that's what they wanted to see. <laughs> yeah, hey, I'm brother. Sure so, that. tell us about first off your book. Tell us. Uh, you know, what made you write this book? There had to be a reason. Well, to tell you, yeah, to tell you the truth, the reason why I wrote this book um, is because I saw a, a need a long time ago um, for the American people um, to be empowered. I felt like the, uh, the American people were not being led down a, a path of empowerment by the government. I felt like the stuff that we knew in the um, in the uh, SEAL teams and in the FBI, I felt like those things were something that that the American people. Hold on one second here, sorry about that. I felt like it was something that the American people um, could use, and it could be simplified to where they wouldn't have to understand everything that we understand about mission development. Um, in order to to truly protect themselves and having I tell you where it really developed was when I was um, when I left the SEAL teams and I was working for AMTI, which I talk about in the book, which was a company that um, was full of SEALs and uh, special forces and different people. <clears throat> what I uh, what I realized um, was that and I was working with the private sector was that uh, the private sector and even the public sector, for that matter, they just didn't get it. They knew how uh, or they had plans to respond uh, once an attack happened uh, from a terrorist point of view. They knew that if an attack happened, that they would react, um, you know, to pick up the pieces in a certain way. But they didn't understand that they could foresee the types of attacks that could happen. 
where those attacks would happen, when the most likely time for them that would happen, and who the people are that would perpetrate these attacks and why. And that was a huge thing because that that is how we determine um, our defensive strategies in the military, but it's also how we determine our offensive strategies in the military. It's how we determine who we're going to attack, how we're going to attack them, because we think like the attack were an offensive attacking force in the SEAL teams. So uh, in developing the book, for a long time I sat on it because I just didn't think <coughs> that the American people and that uh, the, the powers that be in the government um, would be willing to not that they would promote this book, that they would that they would see it as something that's important. And it's hard for the American people to think something's important if the government is constantly telling them, we got it, don't worry about it, you don't have to be empowered, you know, you, you just let us support you. And so uh, I saw at the end of last year that change was coming where with Donald Trump talking about making America great again, I, I saw the number of attacks increasing. And I just felt as though this was the right time to put it out there. And so that's where how it came about and the timing. Yeah, so uh, let's get started because everybody, you know, that uh, for everybody out there, if you got uh, sheet number <laughs> the book, right? Um, <clears throat> first question that I'm going to have answered is, is it only in paperback? Are you dying? <laughs> All right. You want me to come with CPR? No, listen, SHOT Show got me that flu, which I'm still getting over. But uh, – <laughs> Uh, why is it only in paperback? Because this isn't a novel, and uh, I wanted it to be cheap enough for everybody to afford. So um, I just thought a, a, a hardcover, there's no reason for it. This is a book that, you know, like at the end of the book, it has a place for notes. Ultimately, what I'm doing right now is I'm working on a log book that everything that you learn in this book, you can take it and then um, I can, you can take this log book once it comes out and it'll work right with the book where you can chart all this stuff and literally build your target packages. That's what I'm working on now. Um, right. but so, there's no, I want this book to be able to be thrown in a purse or, you know, uh, in a, in a backpack, if you're going somewhere, or if uh, your kids are going to college, I want them to be able to throw it in there with their stuff and take it with them. I don't, it's, this is not a, a shelf book that looks pretty on the shelf. This is a, 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 a book that teaches you a skill set and then <clears throat> sits with you as a, a coach along the way. Yeah, I like that. I like the fact, you know, as soon as I read this, so uh, as soon as I read the first entries here, of course, I, I had mine signed, which right. is awesome. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad I complete you, brother. And you tear <laughs> me down. And I tear you down and bring you back, right? Bring you back better. So, I mean, you had some good people in here that uh, recommended, you know, I see Kitty Kelly's in here. She's on tonight. She's on here. Hi, Kitty. Uh, I'll be over on my show in a little bit. I got to fix some some technical stuff. So. so then we have, you know, when we open up the book itself, you got the dedication. Tell us about the dedication. So of course, the dedication. And, yeah, I and, felt uh, that. But tell us about your dedication and your thought process with that. Well, ultimately, you know, Ron, um, the first responders out there, the people that are on the front line in the war on terror, I look at both of them as on the front line, whether it's the cops, the paramedics, the firemen, um, or the, um, the military service members that are out there. <clears throat> and I even put the patriots and the civilians on that they're on the front line right now, but these people that are in official service, um, they really do need the American people to be a force multiplier for them. You can't just say, um, you know, if you see something, say something and not tell the people what to look for or how to discover what it is that you need to look for. That's kind of ridiculous, you know, in a lot of ways. So uh, I, um, I really dedicate it to the people who were, as you and I were, and I think we still are serving uh, on the front lines and that I hope that this book would be, a force multiplier for them by empowering the people. I want our people, our citizens to be like the Spartans were, you know, the Spartan women, the Spartan men, they were powerful people. And, um, and I want our people to be uh, that way and to have that mindset uh, so that they can um, not just, um, you know, 
understand freedom and claim their rights, but also be able to uh, stand up because the front line is here now, whether it is the political war, um, a subversion of communism, communist subversion or Islam, the front line is here. It's in the, in this country. Um, and then the other people that I dedicated it to, you know, uh, whether it be my mom, um, whether it be, to, I remember uh, you said, I'm going I'm to stop right there. Cause you yeah. said, you said before you wrote this so your mom could read it and understand it. Right. So when I, when I opened the book up and I actually read that part, I was like, no wonder it's that it better be dedicated to your mom. If you wrote to her about it, you know, of course I'm going to have your ass boy. <laughs> I couldn't have done this stuff without her. I mean, she right. was always the one and anybody who's done things like, like we've done that are, you know, unconventional. You're constantly getting people tell you that, you know, maybe you should move on. Maybe this isn't, you know, for you. So my mom, my mom never has told me that. She's always told me, just keep going. You can be what you want to be. I believe in you. And so she's, she's one of the main reasons why I was able to do this book in two months, you know, because she put a foundation in me of, um, of, of stick to and, um, a, uh, a need not to quit. I mean, I get afraid just like anybody else. I mean, you, you know, when you step out of official service, it's a scary thing to try to create a new career, especially when you don't have a pension. I don't have a pension. You know, I didn't retire from any of these forces. So, um, it's a scary thing, but knowing that people believe in you will propel you forward and push you forward. Um, and then family and friends, you know, that have been there along the way that have, uh, mentored me. I talk about some of the mentors that I have as well. Dr. Wally Grand, amazing guy. Uh, he's the guy who operated on Tommy Norris when Tommy Norris, um, when Mike Thornton saved him and brought him in his brain right. exposed. Dr. Grand was a neurosurgeon that worked on him. We met years later when uh, I think I told the story before where I helped um, reunite those three. Um, Tommy Norris and Mike Thornton have known each other, but they didn't know Dr. Grand. And so I was able to reintroduce them. And uh, he's been an incredible mentor to me. Uh, of course, um, my drill instructor, John Crouch, United States Marine Corps uh, that retired um, is an E-9 from the Marine Corps. Jim Grindstaff. I don't know if he really appreciates me saying his full name, but the guy was a, a, an amazing warrior and um, an amazing mentor. He, he's, he's always been there whenever I needed um, knowledge. You know, he's part of Red Cell. This guy's amazing, amazing person. Of course, this guy named Ron Bellin <laughs> who, uh, gave me my first PT test when I was still a civilian to try to come to the teams. Um, you know, he did. After inspiring me, took me down a notch by failing me on my board, which I had to go to ranger school and then come back and, and retake the board, which I passed. And then um, was my land warfare instructor, you know, who taught me how to be a warrior. So you've, you've definitely been there. And then somehow, some way, you know, we end up uh, doing TV and radio uh, together. Yeah, in a lot of ways. I'm, I'm appreciative. First off, I'm appreciative of it. I, I did not expect that because you did not tell me about that. So. When I when I opened the book and I actually saw that I was like, oh, yeah, my name's in a book. Hell yeah, I'm famous now. You know, there's one thing when I look at the reviews of this book on Amazon, it's funny because, and I was going to talk about this tonight on my show. Um, you can tell who the people are who get it and who don't because, you know, when you're going to be a men, uh, somebody who's mentored, a mentee, I guess you call it. Um, you need to show up to the table wanting to learn your job. Isn't to show up and demand to be taught. And, um, and, but the same thing has to be said with the mentor, they have to show up willing to teach and willing to go the distance with this person that they're mentoring. And um, that's one thing that you definitely instilled in me was in land warfare. You know, that was an eight week grind where we had one day off. And, um, it, and you were there every single day you were, you were there everywhere we went and, uh, you never let up and that you expected us to show up to want to learn, but you also showed up to teach and to make it real. And, um, I'm, and you know, uh, it, it shaped the way that I looked at all kinds of operations, whether I was in the air marshals or in the, in the FBI or teaching people, it shaped the way um, I approach things. 
in a much more professional manner. Not that I wouldn't have been professional before, but I see the reality of when you show up to something a hundred percent, um, even though you're not the one who's going to go out like, you, you know, you'd go back to training command. We're the ones that's going to go out and deploy. And, um, you still gave it your all. So, yeah, yeah, well, you can't, you can't, I learned early on that you can't teach somebody something that you don't know. Yep. And you can't expect something from people. Um, you can't expect things for them to do things that you wouldn't do or can't. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so, yeah, I can't just take credit for that because I had a cadre there as well. I just was fortunate enough to be the head guy. But I, I also had a cadre that I opened up the book for him and I said, listen, you come up with something, we're going to do it. And, uh, you know, they were motivated to set charges, you know, that, so we had stuff blowing up around y'all. And, I mean, we did some dangerous stuff that really probably now I can talk about a lot of it because nobody's going to get in trouble now. But we would we would literally blow up things way beyond the limits of what we were supposed to be doing. And uh, there's books, there's safety books, and the safety books are stringent, left and right. And we would take that book and we would we would not throw it away. We would actually look at it, we would study it, and we would swell it up a little bit. You know, we would go outside the box because right. you take that book, you can go outside the box and still be safe. Everything you guys did was safe, but it is the most dangerous job in the world is being a SEAL. So the training that we have is, you know, as close to being as real as we possibly can without shooting each other and um you know i think i think we work in the most dangerous environment but i can't say it's the most dangerous job in the world and i'll tell you why because of guys like you because of the fact that you train us to work in this environment and um it, what really makes a lot of these jobs so dangerous is that people aren't trained to the level that they should be and and so the the environment that we work in is is probably the most dangerous in the world but, oh, absolutely. But um, if you were to take people who weren't trained by guys like you, I would truly say that um, that their jobs would be uh, I, I can't say I guess danger is not the right. There'd be more fatalities, I guess you could say um, there'd be more mistakes. But we we strive and we excel in a dangerous, dangerous environment because we're we train so hard and we're taught very well. Yeah, and that's that's key, you know. So, um, so you know, with all the all the dedications you got here, which is awesome. I've seen Sean Hannity on here. Yeah, his that's- producer, his producer uh, Linda McLaughlin. That girl is a machine. That woman, she's not a girl. That woman is a machine. She's amazing. Rick Unger is yeah. a, a staunch liberal, but still has taught me such incredible lessons um, in radio and television. Um, he's a very giving person a very amazing uh uh, guy incredible career and then david webb as well david webb gave me my biggest shots at uh, radio uh and uh, that's really propelled my career forward um of course i I also uh thank rico and jesse my dogs jesse passed away rico's still alive and then ultimately you know they put it on the back page Uh, i don't know why they didn't put it on the same page there my publisher likes to do things i don't understand about sometimes but um I felt as though it was important to put this acknowledgement in um, not only because ultimately this book, I give God credit and Jesus credit for everything, but um, Saul Alinsky, if you look at that fruitcakes book, he dedicates, there's a dedication in that book to Satan, uh, to Lucifer. And I felt it was important for me to match him one-on-one with the real power and that is, uh, I wouldn't have this any other way than to dedicate this to um, the man who came into this world and gave us the ultimate example of sacrifice for the greater good of others. And um, that would be Jesus and his death for us. Yeah, that takes a, that takes a amount of courage all by itself for any human to do that, let alone, mm-hmm. you know, the things he was doing. So. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah, I couldn't imagine going through that kind of stuff. I've never gone through, obviously, that kind of torture. So, um, so all in all, with your dedications here and, and to move on, because you said something that was really, uh, you know, kind of, you know, um, something that makes sense to me is the fact that we, you know, we, we, what we don't have and what I've noticed in the civilian sector is not putting down civilians at all. There's not a mentorship program in a lot of places. It's all related to education and money. 
money, meaning if you're going to get educated, you need money for it. So, hey, we're grooming you to be the next CEO. Well, or we're grooming you to be the best technician, graphic designer, blah, blah, blah. So we're going to send you a technical school. So we're paying to send you somewhere and pick it when you come back, you know, on yourself. It's not like in the military, and especially in the SEAL teams. I mean, I've worked with the Army. I've worked with, you know, uh, regular Navy. I've worked with Marines. And it seems like the bigger units eat themselves up. They eat up the little guys, the young guys. And, mm. and um, they don't care. They got the thing. It's kind of like going to a big public school and trying out for the football team. They don't really care about mentoring somebody to learn how to play. All they care about is they already got enough people to pick their star performers. And we're going to work on them. And they don't even work on all of them the way they should. But in the SEAL teams, one thing we learned huge is what they call deck plate leadership. And that's, uh, you know, as soon as you get a brand new guy, he's worth something. Right. Absolutely worth something. He got through one of the toughest schools in the world. He's gotten through one of the longest courses in the world. Now it's your turn as a SEAL. And it doesn't matter if you have one platoon or 10. It doesn't matter if you're E5 or an O5. Now it's your turn to mentor them and bring them up. And I think especially in the enlisted ranks, we do a really good job of bringing those E5s up because that's all we get now. We get E5s and they get, they get, e, they come as an E4 and right away you pin E5 on them because it takes that long to get to the training, get to the team. But we, we train them to be leaders, to be in charge, to be in charge of equipment, to be in charge of themselves and to be in charge of people and to be in charge of portions of missions that are frankly, you know, national uh, asset missions, missions that will, determine the outcome of somebody's, you know, uh, nat- national stability, um, you know, a revolution. It could be their decision at that level. Mm-hmm. Shoot, no shoot, uh, go, no goes, uh, the right equipment, comms, doesn't matter what it is. These young men are dealing with more equipment than and more uh, sensitive materials and missions than people could even imagine. And I didn't really realize that until I got – older in the teams of how good we were when I start working with different units and how we good, how good we were at mentoring. So, you know, you mentioned that and uh, I think that's vital. And I think that's important for us is like, you're going to get to talk, like we're going to get into it right now because people got questions. So, uh, you know, when you're talking about your book and what it's about, what it's going to do, we're not going to be able to train everybody in this book in one hour, but what we can do is give somebody enough information in an hour to maybe it'll, it'll bring make them aware and it right. could save their life. And right. to me, if I could save my child's life over mine, I'm happier. Uh, yeah. If I can change, you know, save some, I'm, 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 I'm selfless in that manner. I want to live, mm-hmm. but I also never want to be responsible for having knowledge and not saving somebody else for that reason. So um, with that being said, how, how, how should people attack this book? You, re- I read the book, and I tried to take it one at a time. I took some notes, and uh, yeah. and I have this knowledge behind me, and it's kind of you know, even though I have this knowledge, I don't have some of this knowledge. I was like, yeah, that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. That's uh, that makes sense, you know, something to think of, which is great. I learned. So you, you know, the, the the book was I didn't write the book um, to give people all the answers. I mean, what I've learned, Ron, is that. You can give, you know, the old saying, um, if you give a person a fish, you won't go hungry for a day. But if I teach you how to fish, you won't go hungry for life. The book is a brief overview of a few subjects. Really, it's it's um, it's basically three subjects. What attackers mindsets about what a defender's mindset is about and then um, how you build a target package on yourself. I talk about successes and failures in it for attackers and uh, defenders as well. But ultimately the, the case studies, the stories, all that stuff um, it's all secondary to chapter three, uh, chapter three, four and five, which is really where the meat of this book is. And um, again, the complaints that I've gotten from people in their reviews, and I've got a lot of majority of reviews have been great because people get it. They show up for the right reason. But I don't, I give you the tools that you need to go and discover your critical assets, your vulnerabilities, and your, uh, the avenues of approach that an attacker could take. But I don't teach everything. I don't teach 
uh, every single detail because I don't know that about your home. I don't know that about your place of work. And ultimately, people have to realize that this book will help you understand the way attackers think so that you can look at your individual sectors and determine, you know, where you would be attacked, when that attack would happen and how it would be carried out. That's ultimately, you know, and then, of course, who and why. And that goes to chapter four, uh, five and uh, four and five, where you look at behaviors and surveillance more. But but ultimately, it is um, an overview, but I'm teaching you a skill set and it is repetitive, but it has to be repetitive. I mean, Ron, when you took us through land warfare, you didn't just take us to the 360 degree range, say, OK, don't shoot here. And, uh, you know, you need to get your enemy and do that. You didn't just teach us that once. We did this stuff over and over and we did it in a succession so that you could build up those skills. And, and I tried to write this book basically in the same manner. Right. Well, that's it. You got to start as if, you know, so we always started. And one of the phrases I always use in the SEAL teams was, I don't want to insult your intelligence. Mm-hmm. We're going to start the basics. Some of the best coaches I've seen out there in it doesn't matter if it's uh, the collegiate level or if it's high school or if it's young kids. They start at the basics. My, my son, there's a baseball coach here in Virginia Beach that my son had. And I literally was never so happy when I seen those kids line up. And he literally, kids have been on a team for three years, my son's first year. And he had them grab that baseball, bring their arm all the way back, step forward, and throw. And it was, that's one of the most basic moves you can do in baseball and throwing a ball, whether you know how to throw a ball, a, right. style, a pitcher style or an outfielder style. So there's different styles, but what he did was all the kids start off with basic everything. And he said, he said, listen, you win by scoring more points than the opponent, mm-hmm. but having a better defense. So he doesn't score as much meaning, you know, the way he said it was, we're going to work on the basics of defense, but we're going to be offensive and we're going to learn how to hit, but right. we're going to concentrate on our defense so they don't score. And uh, it's kind of a reverse role in how my life, I live my life offensively, mm-hmm. but you can have a good defense and be offensive. Right. And um, so I, I noticed in your book, the first thing you wrote was the definition of predator and prey. I talked a little bit about that tonight in opening up just because it reminded me of, you know, killing animals and eating them. Versus what you're talking about, predator and prey in the human sense of we walk around every day. We are prey. Humans are strip us of our clothes, Mm -hmm. strip us of our technology, strip us of of our weapons and put us out in the woods. We immediately will turn into prey. We have a predator, predatorial, predator like uh, mindset. But yet we're very, very vulnerable as a human species. So. Yeah, I think, you know, tell us about that. Well, going right along with what you're saying there, I think if you were to go back, you know, 10,000 years or however long it was ago, you know, when when man didn't have necessarily the big um, the big societies, um, I think human beings are predatory in nature. But when they become a part of a society, they they make a shift into prey. It's the same thing as domesticating a dog or, you know, uh, if you took uh, some kind of wild animal and you domesticate them, you you convert them into the mindset of prey. The difference, though, is with humans and prey that you would see when you hunt or as I give the examples on the, uh, the plains of Africa is a gazelle doesn't show up to the watering hole like a human would show up thinking, um, you know, I've got money. There's water. I'm going to get some water and I have nothing to worry about whatsoever. You know, gazelles do not show up like that. They show up saying, I have a need for thirst. I know that there's water there. And I know that this is also where a major threat lies. So I have to be mindful of the wind. I have to be mindful of the direction of the sun. Um, I have to be mindful of where the where the group is moving. And how the group is moving. <clears throat> and they're, you know, a lot of this is instinct, but a lot of it is taught to them by um, by their pack or their herd. And so we look at the, the, the prey on the fields of Africa, and they're very wise. 
they're prey because <clears throat> I would say by and large, they're not um, the type of animal that must kill in order to, to live. They forage. And that's really the difference between, I think, ultimately in the wild is that animals either forage or they hunt. And that's basically what determines predator and prey. But in the, in the human world, um, humans are taught helplessness. Whereas in the animal world, even an animal that forges, um, forges, goes out and, you know, eats, not forges, um, that goes out and, um, what's the word I just used a second ago? Forge. 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 Yeah, forge. Not forge, forge. Um, even those animals are taught defensive mechanisms. They know how if they get, like, at the watering hole and a, and a lion comes, they know defensive mechanisms to get out of there. Human beings are not taught that. So we are literally, we have become the quintessential prey, the definition of prey, where we have little to no defenses on a daily basis. Our mindset is not in, they don't, most people don't even consider that there's threats out there. And so it's very important for you to understand what a predator is and what, a, what prey is. And predators well, they thrive on that because that is how they gain in the wild. That's how they gain their food. <clears throat> and in the human world, that's how they manipulate crowds. That's how they, um, you know, uh, abduct children. That's how they work in the workplace to commit sexual, um, sexual uh, um, uh, harassment or sexual attacks. They, they watch for the behavior of the prey and the helpless and those that don't have the walls built up that don't have the understanding of where the attack could come from. And they literally utilize that to get what they want. And so I felt it was, that is the ultimate definition of the struggle with human beings and trying to protect themselves. Yep. And uh, so with the predator prey thing, I mean, we're not just talking terrorism here because no. it's just a terrorism is a threat. Oh, who's gonna you know who's gonna come here in Virginia Beach and hit the uh, and hit the amphitheater? Well, that's actually probably a good target. That's probably a bad example uh, for a location. But yeah. uh, West of PA, where I'm from, who's gonna go down and when they have a, a parade and the baseball team and the local high school band and everybody's down there, who's gonna hit that? Well, the chances are it's very slim that somebody would. However, there's always some nutcase that could drive through a parade or do something yep. crazy. So. And it doesn't matter what small town. As a matter of fact, I just got a text uh, here a little while ago that somebody robbed no the Westfield Bank. And uh, if you knew my small town of Westfield, I could probably go my checking account and get more with that bank. Not really. I wish. But I'm just they saying. I know who did it. I mean, it's probably going to be a local. Most bank robberies are small uh, $300 at the most. And it's typically somebody who is local. Yeah, <laughs> but, I It'll be interesting to see who they catch. But my but point you know, Ron, to that is Ron, it's not a terrorism. Kid. That is a terrorism is a threat. Don't get that wrong. Yeah. But in everyday living, what is the threat? In everyday living, what is the everyday threat? Living. When I go to work, when I go, I'm yeah. going from A to B. I'm going in and getting a store and getting a coffee, getting a, you yeah. know, cigarettes, coffee. Your everyday, your everyday living, the, the threat in your everyday life is determined by a couple of things. One is, where are you at in your daily life? Are you at home? Are you in your commute? Are you at work? Are you in an entertainment uh, facility or, or a place of uh, where you're eating? Are you at a mall, a religious institution, a tall building, a stadium arena? These are each one of these sectors in your daily life um, will will have spe very specific threats. Sometimes those threats will overlap. You know, you may work in a big city and you may work in a high rise. And at lunch, you go out and you eat in a restaurant. And then on the weekends, you go to a stadium and arena and you come out in the large crowd. So that you could be susceptible to robbery, to, um, to pickpockets. You could be uh, in any of those environments. You could be susceptible to sexual predators or terrorists. Right. So those do overlap. But at home, you're less likely to, to deal with terrorists, um, you know, robbers. There are sexual predators. Burglars are more common. Sometimes robberies are common at home. But each sector, um, each sector, who you are, 
the life that you live, where you live, these are all things that will determine the threat. There is no one specific threat. There are, right. there are vulnerabilities that are common uh, amongst all those things. And one of the main ones is, is our lack of awareness in this country, or so as right I termed there, it, unawareness. So right there, you said it. Uh, you said it right there, and this is what I want people to catch, okay? Yeah. There's not one threat. And you can be, and it's not just one type that's threatened, meaning it's not just the wealthy who are, who are, who are threatened every day. As a matter of fact, most thieves rob from poor people. Yeah. Uh, most, most abductions, uh, sexual assaults, rapes, murders happen in a uh, low income communities. It's not just the wealthy who live behind bars and all that stuff. In fact, that rarely happens that somebody that wealthy here in the United States actually gets arrested. Right. So here we go, folks. This is the nature of this book, right? This is the guts of it to me. So in everyday living, you go through these stages. In one day, you can go through several of the stages. For example, tomorrow. I got to go to the airport tomorrow. So I get up in the morning. Tonight when I sleep, my defense is at night when I'm sleeping in my house. Let's make sure everything's shut, locked. Everything's where it needs to be because I'm going on a trip tomorrow. Yep. But I have an alarm and I have people that uh, will actually be here while I'm gone. So I don't have to worry about that. But what I do have to worry about when I get up in the morning, I go from here to the airport, you know, uh, the traffic and what could happen there. Then when I get to the airport, my airport experience there is, you know, I, there's another threat level. You know, who's in the airport? Who's going through security? Is somebody dropping off a bag? Is somebody leaving something alone? I mean, all these weird little things that can happen at an airport, of course. But I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not going to sit there and just. You're not going through the airport like this. I'm going to be aware You're gonna of be my aware. surroundings. That's all. And then once I get in flight and I get to where I'm going now, I'm a new person in that area. I'm an out-of-towner. Right. So I'm a whole different kind of prey. Uh, pray that as soon as I walk out to get my, uh, you know, to get the car um, or uh, Uber, it could be an Uber driver. It could be somebody stealing my luggage. It could be, you know, there's many different threats that I'm going to deal with tomorrow from leaving my house to getting to the hotel, to going to the convention center, to getting back to dinner and then going back to my hotel room. There's a huge threat level there in many different segments. And in your daily life as a family, not just about you folks, your daughter, your son, your mother, your father, your brother, your wife, your sister, your husband. All that in a day spreads out from the family unity. And Correct. you have several different threats. So let's talk about that from the basic standpoint and what's going to help people out tonight from your book. So I'm going to show you something here real quick. This is um, a video from Fort Lauderdale where I think I can capture it here on the, um, on this cam. So this is in Fort Lauderdale when they had a shooting there and a guy, he actually checked the gun in his bag. You'll see him walk up here in blue in just a second. And he was, he, the guy was crazy. Um, and, but I'm, he's inconsequential in this story. Watch the way people react. And I talk about this in the book. So here comes the guy in the blue right here. Watch how he, and when he pulls the gun out and starts shooting, watch the reaction of the people behind him. And it's interesting that you just, okay, so he starts shooting. Now watch. What, is, what are they behind? And, and watch these other people right here. Let me pull this back up. Dove onto the floor. These are elderly people, right, Ron? So here's yeah. the thing that people have to understand. I've been to this airport. If you turn to the left, that is outside. Yep. It's like 30 feet away where doors go to the outside. Now, when these people, because they're not prepared, because they're not aware, they have no clue that, that everybody thinks up there where security is at is where the biggest threat is. But this is a location where you get off an airplane and there's 200 people waiting for bags guaranteed to be 200 people there. All you have to do is look at the, the schedules and when flights are landing. And these people, they're not aware. They don't understand the threat level. They don't understand that they're in a critical area at a critical time. And they don't understand that if you don't have a plan to act when something goes down, that you're going to react in a very fight or flight type of way. And I'm telling you right now, 
This luggage cart offers neither cover nor concealment. At least this offers some uh, some uh, concealment, maybe this thing right here. But the fact is, the doorway to get out is right over there 30 feet. So I'm going to play one more time and watch how these people react when the gunshot starts because they're they're just not ever expecting for this to ever be anything. So they run for cover behind here, and then these people dive into the middle of the floor, which is very common. And it does it does nothing. It, there's nothing significant that's going to come out of those tactics but it's the only thing that they can think of in a moment of crisis because they haven't studied their daily lives and and the who why where when and how they could be attacked they, they have no clue about that so so to help people out with this because your reaction my reaction we would hope until you get in a situation you never know what you're gonna do but yeah. Majority of the time, we've already got the out. We know what we're going to do. And you you watch people as you showed that video. Most people, as he shot, people ran away and got down. Yeah. Or they ran to an open floor and got down. An in open a floor. Yeah. In a group of people. They got they bunched up. And we, we train not to bunch up when there's right. fire. They bunched up. So it makes it easy for him to turn around and just start capping people that are just laying there. They're easy targets. There's yeah. very easy targets. He killed um, five people that guy. And I can guarantee you um, there were people there that did not get killed, that had the ability to jump on that guy immediately. Um, but people aren't willing to, they're not, they don't have this mindset of, I need to either escape, evade, which ev I don't like to use the term uh, hide or run. I like to use the term escape and evade because that signifies going from cover and concealment to cover and concealment to getting out of there. And if you simply find a hiding space and you stay there, you may actually end up dying in that, in that space, not, not realizing that you're really not hidden. So yeah. the other thing though, that I talked about in the last part of the book is fighting. You know, if you, if you're not, uh, if, first of all, if you don't understand your surroundings, how are you ever going to prepare yourself to escape, evade or fight? So you have to understand the surroundings that you're going into, the vulnerabilities that lie there, the attacker's avenue of approach. And then you must start thinking and plan in your mind, I'm going to act. I'm not going to allow fight or flight to determine my actions. I'm going to determine my actions and I'm going to premeditate them as much as possible. There you go. So your key point right there, somebody just asked the question. This is, and we, we're hitting the answer right now for you, Mark. Mark Sawyer asks, uh, would you say when you travel outside the home, would you say that you become hyper vigilant more so because of your training? And other than books, would you recommend any training for the untrained person like my wife and children? OK, so do I become more hyper vigilant? It's interesting because, again, in the book I talk about where I did um, a little study myself when I was in the FBI because I was in charge for a period of time of. Uh, determining the, the, the threat assessments, um, writing the operations orders, and being the on-scene liaison uh, and uh, not really commander, but uh, I was working with the commanders to um, determine where assets would go and so on and so forth during oper uh, big, big events or incidents. And so I did a study myself to try to determine, you know, that this attack and defend uh, technique that I come up with where um, where the breakdown is in from the mindset that I have, the people I work with and the private sector. And what I discovered along the way is that I was just as guilty as other people of putting my uh, phone up in my face, walking across the road. Um, you know, I watch people drunk at night that um, in, in vicinity of, you know, where the Twin Towers fell, uh, where the, the attack by the guy with the Home Depot truck this year. So I, I started seeing this um, it wasn't so much of a lack of a heightened awareness. It, it was just that there's no awareness. You know, is it heightened awareness to if I'm going to cross the road, take 30 seconds, put the phone down and walk across and look like I was taught as a child? That's not hyper awareness. That's just being aware. And so we think now that that's hyper awareness because we've gotten into this mindset of, the daily grind and not really paying attention. And that's learned helplessness. So 
um, is it was it Mark? It was asking that question, Mark. Yeah. So, yep. so the, the answer, Mark, the first part of that is it's not that I'm more hyper vigilant. It's that I realize myself being a highly trained warrior, an FBI special agent in the most dangerous city in the world, not dangerous in the way of like you walk out of your door and you can be killed, but this is the biggest bullseye in the world for terrorists. Um, I realized that I was just as guilty as anybody else of complacency and comfort. And those are killers when it comes to awareness. The other part of this, um, what type of training, it depends on what you want. You know, do you want to train so that if you ever get in a situation that if you have to fight, that you're going to fight like a pit bull that knows nothing else but win or fight until you die. If that's the case, if that's what you're honing in on, then I would take Krav Maga because Krav Maga repeats every six months. It's not, there's not belts. You're not going to become like 15 years trying to get to this level. Krav Maga was made for their military. So it repeats every six months, but ultimately, and I know this sounds like I'm really pushing this book up. Ultimately, if you want to do something for your family, incorporate what's in chapter three, four, and five and teach that to your family it get not just teach them, but get them involved in figuring out these are where uh, the these are the critical assets. These are the critical areas and the critical times. The vulnerabilities for those exist here. And these are the avenues of approach that attacker could come from. If you do that, you're never going to walk into a situation and be like, I would never have thought that would happen because you'll understand every sector of your life. There's, you know, between five and 10 types of attacks that can happen. Once you visualize that, you're, you will just, your life just takes on a different aspect of safety. So it's not just, you know, I'm going to go get on an airport and I hope I can get through this, you know, real fast because I'm a little late and I got to take my shoes off, my belt off, and this is a hassle. You literally will walk up full well understanding that, you know, if there's going to be attack, it's going to be in the bottleneck security in the airport. is one of the most dangerous places in the world because they force people to bottleneck and they do, you know, at this side of the of security is completely protected. This side is not protected at all. So you understand that you understand that the arrivals where the baggage comes is a huge critical area and the critical times wane there. They go up and down. If you're going to pick somebody up and you're waiting for them in the arrival section, um, it's best for you not to show up early and hang out because you're literally putting yourself into a critical area where there's going to be critical times, critical times, critical times are going to come up and down. Meanwhile, your friend or your relative is on the plane. Um, That critical time for you and them to meet is this big. But if you stay there and hang out, you're now caught up in all these critical times. That's right. You are. So if you're not aware of that, uh, then you're going to walk right into these things. So I would say that the ultimate thing you could do for your family is to help develop their awareness. Even a nine-year-old kid can be aware. And uh, so, you know, you can teach a nine-year-old kid, this is a gun uh, and this is how it works. This is how you shoot it. And this is why you don't touch it. And you can teach a nine-year-old kid that. And um, uh, you can also teach a nine-year-old kid, uh, this is how attackers um, pinpoint locations. This is how you can look at your location and say, this is a critical area. This is a critical time. These are the vulnerabilities. And this is the attacker's avenue of approach. A kid can learn that. And then if you want to do specific training for, uh, you know, for self-defense, that's a whole other thing. Yeah, the... uh... The limit critical times, uh, limit your critical times throughout the day, which means exactly what uh, Jonathan just said. You know, uh, people do make that that mistake of sitting right there. And as more and more people are rolling through there, there's critical time. And then it's less than more than less. Go to, you know, if you're if you're at the airport early, what do you do? Go to the coffee shop and go up there and and get a cup of coffee. Get out of that situation, you know, uh, Go sit in the parking, you know, the cell phone area out in the uh, airport. Right. Call your friends and, uh, you know, bide your time. Uh, read a book. Do something else. But don't sit there and and just become part of what might be a problem later. And, you know, Rod, and, uh, also, when you develop this awareness, the other thing that happens is 
you don't sit there. I've got several videos on here where from the Las Vegas shooting where everybody interviewed, the first thing they said was, I just thought that was fireworks. Well, I've been to a lot of concerts in my life. Never been to one where fireworks start in the middle of a song. Right. I've also, right. I live not very far from where that Home Depot truck ran over all those people on the bike path. I used to ride that bike path all the time on my stupid scooter before I had to crash. And um, I, I, you never see a vehicle on there. There would have been no reason to sit back and say, oh, that's probably just a prank for Halloween. Right. You see a vehicle mowing people over, your first reaction should be, I'm getting off the bike path. That guy's killing people. But people yeah. don't think that way because they're not aware because they haven't trained themselves um, in this type of awareness. So in the other part, Mark, for training is in uh, that it was and for everybody else out there is mentally, you know, go yeah. through when you get into a situation, the danger areas, you're going to go through these danger areas. So, for example, the video he showed, you know, everybody's getting their luggage and all that. But as soon as the gun's pulled out, you might not see the gun, but you hear it. Crack pack, of, you know, the crack, uh, the pops and, and you hear it. It's like somebody snapping their fingers and, and it's a loud ring and it's just not normal sound that you're going to hear. Um, you know, you should have already known, okay, there's an exit there, there, and there. I'm coming up on an exit. I'm passing that exit. Now in front of me is that one. Behind me is that one. You get on an airplane, it's the same thing. You get in a car, you know where your doors are. You know where the handles are. You go to a restaurant, you know where the front entrance is. Do you know where the side is, the back one is? You know, I mean, just little awareness will take you a long way. So then that plays in your mind because you already thought of that. And, you know, and, and now you're ready. And something does happen. At least you have thought of that. Those people probably never even thought, oh, that's an accident. If something happens, I'm going. If they had just said that once in their head, that might have saved them from landing in the open floor. Or they might have got down at first and then got up quick and moved out. Right. Because um, sometimes the reaction you get is get down, assess, go. You know, it's um, it's all dependent. So I got a couple questions for you, and then I want to get to chapters three and four and five and, and break that down and what somebody could use. I got uh, uh, James, um, who's uh, badass babe's uh, husband. <laughs> What's up, James? So uh, he's probably he's probably in the shower listening to us because that's what he does. He showers, he does all his stuff, and still listens to the Reaper show, which I think is awesome. So he says, time and space slowing down during an attack. Can that be learned? Well, you know, it's. In, I, I will tell you this. Uh, Ron said it best. You never, you don't know how you're going to uh, act when you're. You don't know how you're going to react when you're in a stressful environment until you've been in a stressful environment. That's why it's important for you to put yourself in these types of environments. And so that you can, you can build your ability to act rather than just react. And I think there's a couple things here. One, you know, a lot of these uh, Olympic athletes will sit and go through the entire race in their minds over and over the entire race, not just part of it. They'll do the entire race and they'll race it against the clock. Um, they'll have a clock in front of them. And they sit there and see themselves stroke and breath, stroke and breath, for instance, with swimmers. Divers do the same thing. Um, it's important for you to think your way through these, just like as a child, you're taught the what if game to what if this and think your way through it. That's going to help you in your actions. The other thing is I challenge people. I talk about this in the book about the ice uh, bucket where you take an ice bucket and you put your hand in this ice bucket. And I'm, I'm not kidding you. If you're, if you're not used to pain for about two and a half minutes, maybe three minutes, it's going to hurt worse than anything that you have probably felt in a long time. I mean, I tore the, the, the quadricep tendon off my knee and that hurt, but putting your hand in ice water is just as painful. But it goes away after a few minutes, and it doesn't cause permanent damage. In fact, that's what you do when you injure your hand. So, But what happens is your ability to think is diminished because you go into a fight or flight almost a um, almost as if your, your body is going into a crisis mode. Um, and so I challenge people to, like, you know, do your multiple tables. Like, I'm terrible at math. One will tell you I'm terrible at math. Um, or, or, or have somebody sit with you and ask you questions 
about, you know, something that you should probably know. And with your hand in that bucket of ice, keep it in there for about four minutes, five minutes, and then take it out and then consciously put your other hand back in there. And uh, what's going to happen is immediately you're going to put your hand in that bucket of ice and you're going to want to pull it out because you're going to be like, this is stupid. I don't have to do this to to understand how to, how to act in a stressful environment. But see, that is the exact place where you will fail when you're in a stressful environment. Because if your mind is not used to thinking under stress, you will break down and you will succumb to fear uh, when it comes to a stressful environment. So um, riding a roller coaster, do you lose all sense of your ability to think when you ride a roller coaster? If you go to Six Flags or something like that, go ride a scary roller coaster and then get off and then ride it again. Except the second time, try to think while you're going through it. Ask yourself questions. Um, Have a conversation with the person next to you. Can you do it? And what you'll find is after a while of doing these uh, stressors, your mind will be able to deal with panic and fear much greater than um, than if you just walked into a situation with no preparation whatsoever. Does that answer the question? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he's not here to he's not here to get that um uh so yeah i tell you what people ask your questions i'll get to them as soon as i can but uh you know um it's it's hard i'll try to have shorter answers for for if there's a lot of questions yeah so top three ideas this is from jeremiah alexander top three ideas to keep yourself and family safe and prepared i was going to say that for the end um okay. after we talk about some more stuff and then we got uh Matt White Giver talks about rural places. He lives up in Maine and and talks about, you know, we talk a lot of, a lot of people think cities, right? But rural areas is a huge threat there as well. Uh, rural, so. r- rural areas have uh, just as much of a threat to daily. Um, you got to remember there's less people. So the, the times that it happened are going to be less, but the pot, and I talk about this a lot in the book. The difference between probability and possibility. Forget about the numbers, man. We're taught numbers constantly. You know, that stupid Homeland Security uh, color code system, right? People literally would think we're under more of a threat because it's up here than we are when it's down here. And that's not true. You're under a constant threat depending on where you live. And uh, the veracity or the, um, the number of times that these types of attacks, different attacks could happen is uh, maybe less in one place just because there's less people. But you go to a small town or you go to a big city, the same types of crimes happen. It's just that they happen less in a small area. So start looking at the possibility, not the probability. And uh, what what was the exact question, Ron? It was uh, just the exact question was, uh, you know, how it just said, how about rural areas? Okay. And we're talking a lot about, you know, don't, yeah, don't take it for granted. You should still have your awareness, even in a rural area, because there are I've got plenty of examples of sexual predators, of workplace uh, violence, of even terrorist attacks happening in uh, small locations and rural locations. I was on CNN. I did a uh, uh, analysis of a guy. Um, I don't remember where that was, where he shot a guy 16 times who had a knife, a a cop, a white cop shot a black guy. That's all they ever had me on CNN for. And he shot him 16 times and then reloaded his weapon. They made all these accusations that he's going to reload his weapon and keep shooting. His weapon was empty, you know, and the guy never dropped the knife. So, but long story short, um, I got a lot of death threats because I made the analysis that the cop was absolutely 100% uh, right in his action. It was a good shoot. One of the people that threatened my life was a guy who was in the Marine Reserves who is an immigrant from uh, Somalia and said that he hoped ISIS um, raped my wife and daughters and slaughtered them before me. He must've been Muslim because that's what they say. I don't think he's in uh, Marine Corps anymore, (laughs) but, um, but so rural areas, Little Rock, Arkansas, where I'm from recruiting station there was attacked by a terrorist, you know, Tennessee, same thing. Don't take it. All you gotta do really say to Matt is, uh, the rest area, and you know what I'm talking about, Matt. Yeah. The rest area. Uh, there's a rest area up there by his place. It has no facilities at all, but it's one of Matt's favorite hangouts. 
<laughs> and you gotta be laughing right now because there's predators there. And uh, literally, the, the state police, the main state police, go up and down Route Nine, and there's nobody around. There's no phones. There's no electric. Not even past that rest area for a long time, long stretch. There's no yeah. electricity. So, uh, you know, it's a very vulnerable spot. So make sure you have gas in your vehicle and make sure you can get to the next town. You know, I mean, that's uh, that's what I say. But Matt knows exactly what that joke's about. We're going to leave it right there for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> absolutely. So let's get started with uh, some of the books. Um, James said he, he got you. Yes, he, that was good. It was a great explanation for his question. And. Um, so I have notes, believe it or not, in my book here. Oh, man. So, and you touched on it. So chapters three, you have a lot of things in here about sectors. Yeah. And, you know, so I, I picked up one. One thing was the vulnerabilities for the first three uh, criticalities. And I like that word criticalities. It actually threw me for a loop for a minute, but I figured it out. I pronounced it. And um, that's on page 36. Okay. So here you have, uh, you know, steps, you know, steps one, two, and three, which break it down pretty nicely for, uh, especially a, a, you know, knuckle dragger like myself. You know, you divide your life into sectors. Number one, right? So we taught you taught touched on that, and then, and then from that, then uh, sector, or, or I'm sorry, two. Is, I took home. Uh, I took the sector of home and decided because I know everybody has a home. So and then yeah. you dissected that into the criticalities. Yep. And then you take that. So you take those, you know, you take, so basically you divide your life into sectors. So you have all these sectors. Then you take that sector, one sector, say you're home. Cause that's where, you know, honestly, you spend a lot of time at home people when you're home and you know, your home, that's your backyard. You know, when that door opens, you know, when the kids come in and out, you know, that's your environment. That's your world. You should know that better, but, then you, you take that critical stage there because that'll be the quickest one, correct? That'll be the one you know the best. Right. And but here's really, the key to this, Ron. Here's the key to this, Ron. You yeah. just said it. You know your home the best, right? But let's look at privacy fences. People that know their home very well, they put up a privacy fence because they want to have some privacy from their neighbors. What they don't realize is that that fence also protects a, a robber or somebody who wants to do something bad from being seen by your neighbors. So if you're not thinking like a bad guy, you're not going to realize how a bad guy can utilize that very thing that you put up to their advantage. And that's why when you look at these sectors, you don't identify the critical assets, critical areas and critical times from your point of view. You look at these areas and you define them from an attacker's point of view. That's you'll see it totally different. That's it. So you, you hit it, you know, so, you know, you see it from uh, so. If, and a great example for me in my world was my daughter, her room. Yeah. So her room was a sector in my house, and it was always a, uh, you know, because it's your daughter, man. You know, you protect that that beautiful, you know, young lady, and and in any way, I will kill somebody. They freaking ever touch you wrong, right? So when you're little, and uh, it's just too much of that crap going on. But you know, and I'm also thinking when she was a teenager, boys coming and you know, her getting out of her windows and, you know, so there's a predator right there, young man, but it's not necessarily a young man. It's, you know, it's, it could be somebody who's been watching the house and, and knows our routine, knows the kids go to bed at eight 30 every night or nine o'clock. And they know when that light goes out over here, mom and dad are on the other side of the house. Now it leaves their kids vulnerable. So seeing it from that perspective, you know, what the bushes are outside, you know, I mean, I thought about planting all this cactus, but uh, I wasn't going to do that, but uh, I thought about it. I'm not going to lie to you. And, uh, you know, putting bars on the windows. <laughs> right. Especially when they got old enough to start sneaking out. And if they're watching, they know what I'm talking about because my kids did do some of that. But actually the windows, the windows that I have in the house, you can get air. If there's a fire, they could get out. They'd have to break the window, but it's very easy to do. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> And they could through the frame. They open the window. They push the frame out. It's done. Um, but as a robber, they it's an outward opening window, which means once they're shut and they're locked down, it's very hard to open an outward door. It's easy or window. It's very easy to push them in. So that was some of the critical thinking I had with my kids' rooms. And I'm just using my daughters for an example. I had the sector of the house, but I had that particular room. And then my sons 
and then you know the hallways, the bathrooms, and then obviously the front door, the side doors, the, the garage doors, you know, and all the entry points that you you know have to shore up. So once right. you do that, you realize how many entry points are actually in your house. Yeah, that's the other thing. How many entry points? You know, Samantha Smart. I interviewed her after her special was on. I interviewed her on Sean Hannity's radio show, and she, um, uh, the, the guy who abducted her. Um, had come there for work and I think he worked on their roof or something like that. But the way he gained access to their house was because their mom had cooked some food and she opened up the kitchen window to allow it to air out. And that's how he got in. So, you know, you you don't really, you don't think that the kitchen window is a entry point. Everybody locks doors. um, But they don't realize that, um, that, that, any place that can be breached is an entry point. And right. most of these people who abduct children or rob homes, uh, when people are there, they don't break glass. Um, they just find a way that something that's been left open and then they gain entry that way. They break right. glass. They're going to notify you. So if you do have a gun, it puts them at a disadvantage. That's right. They're going to try to get in that house one way or another, even if it's, Maybe strangers that needed a place to stay one night and they decided, you know, hey, you're going to stay in a spare room. And, you know, that'd be very dangerous to do. But, you know, uh, there's a threat level. So we talked about sectors, and that's what three pretty, uh, chapter three talks a lot about. And uh, chartering target package information. It's uh, So tell us about what that means. What, what, I know what it means, but yeah, what is a target package information? What are you talking about? Okay, so here's what people need to realize is that, uh, and I'll try to make this as short as possible. You know, a guy who picks pockets for a living, he doesn't just go out one day and decide to pick pockets. And, uh, and then he just randomly grabs people's wallets. These are people who spent a career developing, uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures to accurately get their hands on people and take those wallets. Then they study the environment. They don't just walk into Times Square and start doing that because they're going to get caught by cops or somebody's going to tell on them. So they learn how the the um, the the influx of tourists ebbs and flows. They learn how to where where the best avenue of approach is at. They they realize that that maybe in the middle is not the best, but possibly over on one of the side streets is even better. So what they do is they look at. Um, this an individual sector of the city <coughs> and then they divide that up they look at what knowingly or knowingly they don't necessarily use these these terms but they'll say okay the critical assets what do i need to hit that's going to give me what i want right if there was a terrorist they might say um wh- what do i have to destroy in order to st- to stop this facility from functioning and to break down freedom, for instance, or to cause pressure on people. And in Times Square, um, the critical assets really are not, it's not just people for, for somebody who picks pockets because you would have to throw cops in that mix. So they look at, um, is somebody a worker that works at McDonald's? They're probably not going to target that person. Is it somebody who, you know, is dressed like, (laughs) <laughs> that has some kind of Brazilian soccer shirt on and there's a soccer match, that may be somebody that they target. So they are basically looking at the critical assets. They're looking at the critical areas where the people congregate and the critical times. So they're not going to go try to pick pockets at three o'clock in the morning in Times Square, but they will try to go pick pockets at six o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday when the most people are in Times Square. It's, you just can't hardly move. Right. So lunchtime is another time. Once they define those, they can break those down and say, okay, you know, like I, I just said, they, they determine the critical assets, <coughs> the critical areas and critical time. So they would say the critical asset are tourists that we can identify as tourists. The critical areas are not necessarily the middle of Times Square, but it's the side streets because those are less watched. And the critical times will be at like six o'clock or noon uh, noon during the week and six o'clock uh, in the evenings on a weekend. So they have identified 
those those criticalities and the vulnerabilities they can exploit. Once they do that, now they can determine their avenue of approach to that person. You see how that works. So that's how you develop a target package. Because ultimately, once you determine your credit your your sector, the criticalities for that sector, that's the critical assets, critical areas, and critical times, you can then determine what vulnerabilities you can exploit to hit those and what your best avenue of approach can be. Once you do that, you can determine all the different types of attacks. You could say, I'm going to pick pockets. I'm going to kill people. I'm going to throw uh, fake blood on people who have furs, whatever it is. You can determine, is that going to be effective at this location, at this time, against that particular uh, critical asset? And that is a target package. Once you develop that, you can sit back and look at every aspect of your life and say, this is how I would be attacked, where I would be attacked, when I would be attacked, what type of attack it would be, and who would most likely carry that attack out. That is how you develop a target package. I would take that. I would take this because there's uh, certain training. Uh, there's certain training uh, things, programs that I've been through. Uh, right here in the United States and around the world. There's also uh, different programs that have worked around the world that literally when I got home, I was paranoid. I was paranoid around home. I was paranoid when I go to work every day. Um, those critical areas, you know, uh, so my my thing is not to be paranoid, but the thing is, you know, hearing this, so it's and, and kind of find out it wasn't so much paranoid. I was just taking what I learned right. for my job and I was applying it to my uh, my life as a civilian. And because you'd never so looked after, at your life from an attacker's point of view, even you probably yeah. hadn't. Yeah. And after a while, I realized that you know, once you do that, after a while, then I wasn't paranoid anymore. I was just aware. So I went from being paranoid to a more my awareness opened up. Right. And uh, so I can thank you know thank for those classes, but. Uh, you know, because that's helped me not just avoid crime or being bugged or something like that. It also helped me avoid accidents. It helped me avoid a major accident to happen in front of me. And some of the, so a, a prime example is every day people drive to work every single day. Mm -hmm. There's people out there that go to the same four, five days a week, Monday through Friday. They get up at five o'clock in the morning. They grab their cup of coffee. They might even have a little breakfast. They get get another second cup of coffee, get in their vehicle and they drive and they drive the same route every single day. Right. They had the same stop every single day and they know the stop signs. They know the stop lights. They know the traffic pattern. They know uh, they might even see some of the same runners in the morning, the drivers in the morning. And the second something's out of whack, they're going to be aware of that. But at the same time, it's a routine they're stuck in. Where they, if they don't know the vulnerability spots, they're going to be that person in that accident. Yeah. And, um, or they're going to be the person who gets robbed, or they're going to be that person that gets abducted, or they're going to be that person that becomes a, uh, you know, murdered, or, you know, or, you know, which is like the ultimate worst. But so in that, in this chapter three alone, what I do and what I would like everybody out there to do is take this, take this section and, and dissect it. And just take time with your family, your children. Uh, your children have a set schedule probably every day, whether they get on a bus and they take the same route every day. Um, so your family, your wife, a question just came in from David Lynch. How do you get your spouse to become aware of their surroundings? Let me answer this first, Jonathan. Go ahead. I have an easy solution for that. Get bigger life insurance on her. Invest in your wife. And when she asked, why are we spending so much money on my life insurance? Say, because you are not aware. <laughs> you can't go shopping this week because I got to pay for your life insurance. You know what? I, you know, here, I'll tell you the truth is start doing this in front of them and they will not be able to to be involved. They're going to tell you, well, you forgot about this or what about this? Um, you know, it's like if you ever try to tie a knot or undo a knot in front of somebody and somebody else is standing over you and you're having trouble with it. People want to get in there and like take over because they think they can do it better. Well, if you're if you're sitting here doing this in front of people, um, chances are they're going to um, they're going to try to help you out with that. And if they don't, 
if you complete it and show it to them, um, it may spark an interest where they say, well, you forgot this or what about this? Uh, and it may also look the best thing you can ever do to a spouse or a child is plant seeds. Sometimes you can't tell them what to do. You can't make them get involved, but you can plant the seeds in their mind. And, um, that may be one way to do it. Yeah. The, the other, uh, critical criticality of that, if you will, if I can use that word, <laughs> see that it's rubbing yep. it off already, man. I'm, I'm, feeling like a, I'm feeling like a bona fide option <laughs> using these big words, big words, the big words. that mean such little things, criticality, <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, with that awareness and here's a, here's a very good point to this. Um, and I just like using examples. So the other day, Charlotte and I were driving around here, going to different stores and, uh, you know, whatever, just going to different stores and finally going to eat, going to base, all this other stuff. While I was driving, I was thinking about what I was doing. And I just thought, well, I'm getting a little close to that car in front of me. And uh, so I backed off a little bit at a stop sign, a stoplight. And I turned to her and I said, hey, do you know if, if uh, I want you to learn something? And I, I probably thought of that because I've been reading Sheep No More. And it just kick, it just hit in. I was, I always do this. So at a stoplight, you never get so close to the person in front of you that you can't turn a right or left, and you don't have an out. Right. Always set yourself up for an out. If if you're going down the highway, you always set yourself up for an out of a traffic accident. Somebody in front of you hits something immediately. You can turn right or left and get around it, and you have enough time to react. It's the same way because I worked the counter narcotic stuff in South America. Mm-hmm. This is where I learned that was a school and a course we took in South America and another one we did actually right here in Virginia Beach. But one of them was the driving and, uh, you know, to be aware while you're driving, but not to get so close to somebody that if somebody blocks you in, that you can't just drive out of it straight. Right. right. Or have a, have a lane where you can push somebody on a panel and continue through. That's a little bit more advanced. But I was bringing that up to Charlotte. She's like, yeah, I know that. I know that part. And she does know some of it, but you know, that just makes you a little aware, but now whether she does or not, she does. Right. And that's how you can do that with your spouse and your kids. Like, uh, you know, get get closer. It's like, no, this is why you don't get closer. You make it like, make a spy game, make it a, you know, uh, for the kids, you know, this is why we don't get close to vehicles and that will be in their head forever. Yeah. You know, don't get boxed in. Those types of techniques you can teach, you know, people like, um, like how to, how to find a bottleneck when you're walking on a sidewalk, if you think you're being followed, you know, if you think you're being followed, you need to enter into a building, walk the perimeter of the building inside and then walk back out and see if that person follows you or waits on you. Um, that's a good way to determine whether or not you're being followed. And once you determine that, then you call authorities. Oh, you know, that, that, <laughs> Here's a funny story, Jonathan. I went through a course, and, and, and here's the deal. Somebody's following you, right? So uh, you make three right turns or three left turns, right. all in sync. If they're still behind you, chances are they're following you. Right. Well, I I was uh, going home, and I made a right turn. Yeah, I have to I literally make four right turns. It's crazy. Uh, so I turned right, and then, then when I made that second turn, I noticed this car behind me I'd never seen before. When you get in my neighborhood – uh, there's a point where you have to make three rights and one left. Well, I made those three rights and somebody was on my ass. So I'm like, damn, I'm going to make a, I'm not going towards my house. That's one thing you don't do. I didn't take them to my house. Right. I took them away from my house, but I made another right turn. <laughs> and they, uh, and they follow me again. That's four right turns. I'm like, they're freaking following me. So it was obviously so, somebody that you knew. I no, I pulled over in the neighborhood i pulled over and they pulled over and i got out and i said what are you doing (laughs) it followed me and uh the guy said well i live right here (laughs) he literally was uh, a guy that was on the base he had just him and i had the same path home that day and just worked out at those turns so you know i was just i'm sorry mr bell no he didn't know who i was he was actually lived down the road from me but uh uh, it was funny. I told him, I said, Oh, I thought you were following me, man. I, and I pulled up and I went straight ahead and I went a whole nother roundabout just to get back home. So he didn't know where the hell I live. <laughs> but you know, that's awareness, you know, and that's being aware that somebody's not being paranoid. That was a little paranoid, but when somebody follows you for freaking turns, something's going on. Right. All right. Yep. So here's 
let's uh, let's skip right into chapter four. Unless you got something else, Jonathan, you want to point out in three? No, I just I just want people to realize that um, you don't have to overthink this stuff. I mean, the way I have it laid out, um, the more detail you give, the better you're going to be able to figure it out. But literally, um, it'll things will just unfold to you. you you'll start to just see it. Um, develop as you're as you're picking up these different things if you follow very closely what i wrote in for each sector you'll start to see that it doesn't take a rocket scientist to do this um that's right that's just it's just it's really the perception from which you approach it you can do this with your teenagers you know that drive to school every day do this with your wife and say hey listen let's do this today it could be a little thing you know we're going to talk about our vulnerability points because here's the deal Break your stuff in sectors, but it's, I, I like to put it in stuff that can happen every single day and night without another human being hurt yet. A fire in your house. Right. And you get a fire in your house, you got to know your exits. You get a fire at the airport, you got to know your exits. You, uh, you know, something like that. You know, just think of it that way. The traffic accident on the roads. You know, you got to think about having alternate routes. So right. those sectors, those sectors, you break them up for what can happen. And I talk about survival and I'm going to talk about the apocalypse. You know, it's falling down. I'm always talking about natural disasters happen. You know, floods, it happens, hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, all this stuff. What do you have to be prepared? This is the same thing, except for that time, that one time, that one, that percentage time that somebody's doing evil and unjust to you, your family members, that you have an out. It's because of this book right here. Right. So, damn, I wish I wrote this book. <laughs> uh, you could have. Be, criticality <laughs> would not be one of my words in there, I'll tell you that. <laughs> okay so uh here's the remote information collection right and this is uh you know this is vital in today's world because of the technology and the access of information i, I mean i can get people's information in a, in a nanosecond yeah all you do is google it and, a, and most people they, don't do that it's important for them to realize that you have to go look at what your, your what of your information is online there you go. Can we talk about that, Jonathan? Talk about that a little bit. Well, I mean, what that mean? So, what bad guys do is they they don't start from the up close and then work their way out to discover information about you. They start as far away as they can. Terrorists do this. Um, uh, pedophiles are notorious for this, where they'll go on Facebook or they'll go on Twitter and 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 go through the different profiles where people just throw massive amounts of pictures of their children of their children up and then they also show where they're from or where they work in some of these pictures and so a pedophile can develop a uh, a, a fixation for a specific child um, or family by what they see online so once they develop that from a remote um, remember remote information collection there's really two types of information collection it's standoff and up close. That's all you got to think about, really, for, for, the, for general terms. Remote surveillance or standoff surveillance, bad guys are going to uh, try to determine um, as much about you as they can without ever getting up close. Another example of this is a story that I gave in the book where I looked at a stadium and arena um, in a location where I lived and discovered that by looking at Google Maps that um, – that and I'll, I'll bring this up here for you so you can see it that um let's see here um let me think of the name of the facility uh buh, 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 buh. so basically what i discovered was that from this uh from the from the satellite imagery i was able to determine um where uh the majority of people trafficked um in and out of one of the arenas that's there because the sidewalk has uh, is uh, worn down and is a different color from where uh, the people uh, for, from the, uh, the rest of the sidewalk. And let me see, I'll try to, I'll try to bring this up here. Let me, let me find it real quick. Whoops. Um, let's see here. Pretty easy for me to find this out here. Um, let's see here. Stand by one second. Cause this is important for, this is important for people to see how this works. I just have to realize where I'm at here on the map. Uh, yeah, here it is. 
So let me think here. I don't want to give away the location um, that I'm that I'm talking about here because I don't want um, people to think that I'm giving away um, specific locations. But uh, so let me get rid of this. So check this out. So this is all it took right here, Ron. If you look real close, you see that difference in the in the sidewalk right there. Mm-hmm. You see that? So if I back off a little bit, you're going to see it. There's the edge of a stadium right there. And once I look at the rest of the sidewalk, and if I if I panned out on this, you're going to see that it's not the same. I literally can see where people walk uh, in the most likely area that they're going to exit this. See how white this is right here, how white it is right there. So I can get all that from remote surveillance, right? I don't even have to go there to get that about a specific location. Once I have that, then I can determine um, where the best place is to attack uh, this facility. So I tried that at other locations around the country. And I kid you not, I saw the same thing at big, huge stadiums and arenas. And uh, so determining uh, a lot of the stuff that you need to carry out an attack can be done through remote surveillance. So if you're looking at your life and your daily life from an attacker's point of view, you're going to be able to determine these things. Uh, And it's all done far away from where the facility is. I'm I'm literally a a thousand miles away from where this location is right now. So if I was going to attack it, I could determine the most critical area. And then once I I want to determine the most critical time, all I got to do is look for the event schedule that's online for this facility. And I don't know that, that people walking in or especially when they're all walking out, that that's going to be the location to hit right there. Yeah. So with that, with that technology and what you just showed us, you know, that's an assessment, that's assessment. The bad guys look at, you know, right. And it's also something that the good guys look at when you're setting up security. That's right. It's also something if, if a family is going to a park, if a family is going to an event, that you can just go ahead and search that out real quick, pick spots out like that where there's going to be a crowd of people. You know, that's everybody's bunched up here. And then you also have, and, and with that being said, you can also sector that area out. Right. And you can say, hey, if something happens, we're going to have a meet point here so you don't get bottlenecked with everybody else in the critical area. Correct? That's absolutely correct. So here, I'll show you again. This is a, where I'm pulling out a little bit of, uh, okay, so here again is the location that I was looking at. And you can see around this location that uh, right here is, there's areas where the the cement is lighter than it is in other places. So you know that there's going to be, see, it's not very, there's not very uh, much difference in the way that the cement looks over here, but there is over in this area right here. Um, And then this area is pretty much, normal back in here so we know the majority of people exit in in right here and then they either go down this exit over here or they go down this exit over here so there is an exit all the way up over here that is rarely used there's also another one over here so if i'm anywhere in this arena i'm gonna leave and i'm gonna go out one of these two exits i'm gonna stay away from this area how do i determine that 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 is the way it is i'm looking at it from an attacker's point of view and i'm saying if i'm going to attack this is most likely the area the two areas where i'm going to attack and most likely this one so i'm going from a defender standpoint i'm going to avoid that and i'm going to go here and it really that's a great that's a great way to look at it. i love it man this is awesome <laughs> and that that uh, that is you can do that all over the country at different locations. It's really, it's really, but th- this is how important remote surveillance is of the areas where you live at. Now, the other thing is you can go on and you can look at the times uh, when these um, facilities are going to have events. Yeah. You can choose to in your family to leave 10 minutes early or stay there 15 minutes later where after everybody else is gone and then work your way out. <laughs> Again, you can look up um, the location where you live. You can look up the crime statistics uh, and you can determine if, if you, you know, is it more likely for for a robber to come into your house? And you can look more towards 
how uh, th- how as a robber you could ex- exploit the vulnerabilities in and around your house. So online remote surveillance is very important. Um, it also gives you a a breakdown of <coughs> the types of people in a given area. Is there a certain race of people that live there versus others? Um, are they younger or older? Is it um, the villages down in Florida or is it Manhattan? It's going to be two totally different people in those areas. And they're going to dress totally different. They're going to look different. And what's the normal behavior at the villages where it's almost it's all retirees versus the behavior of people in and around Yankee Stadium? Two totally different areas uh, for you to look at. And uh, once you get up close to those, which is the next step, you're going to see the difference in behavior. Uh, of these, the, and the crime rates are going to be different. So, what about now? We're talking about that. What about like uh, anniversaries of uh, other attacks, hi, uh, historical sites? You know, uh-huh. uh, you can look that up as well. Correct? Absolutely. <clears throat> you know, um, Timothy McVeigh hit on the anniversary of uh, the Waco attack, right? Uh, or I don't know if you want to call it an attack, but the Waco incident. Um, uh, Benghazi happened on 9-11, 2012, 12 years after, or 11 years after 9-11, 2001. So anniversaries um, are, are very significant and people need to take this. Columbine is an anniversary that people should take seriously. Although there's never been a repeat, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there's some crazy lunatic out there that's looking for a date to, to, to do some type of school shooting and that would be a good date. Right. <laughs> It'd be very symbolic. So you have to, again, look at these things from an attacker's point of view and ask yourself, why would that be a good date? Well, it'd be a good date because um, you would you would be able to decimate uh, law enforcement training by repeating what happened at that at that day at that time. You know? Yeah. And the other the other thing. So now that's chapter four with. Uh... Mapping, libraries, newspapers, internet, all the information's at the touch of a finger. Nowadays, overseas, you might have to do a little bit more homework, but it's there. It's still there. Also, you got to remember, Ron, that when you look at um, at a city and the way it's laid out, um, cities are like strip malls. They're a copycat of every other city. <clears throat> every city has an airport, a stadium and arena, tall buildings. They have malls. Um they have uh, shopping malls. They have they have uh, religious institutions, schools. Uh, they all have the same exact. I don't care where you go in this world, it's the same thing, over and over and over. Now, what so, about what about uh, threat assessment overseas? Can you find that out online through the State Department or something like that? The threat you, if you're traveling abroad, you can get um, threat, um, not necessarily a threat assessment like this. But you can get, uh, they'll tell you about, which I talk about in, in uh, the next to the last chapter. Yeah. <clears throat> you, can, um, you can find out about um, what the State Department determines uh, what level of threat a certain like, location has. Okay. Yeah, I just, you know, that's why I wanted to touch on that with four, just because of the information flow. So that pushes us right to five. Yep. And uh, chapter five, on-site information verification and collection. You know, up close and personal, being a headliner, but the you know, and of course you got the surveillance tips, which is awesome. You know, a quick chart there, and then uh, you break it down to you know to each sector, you know, not sector, but you know, foot surveillance. And the one thing that I took a note on was behavior recognition, right? Um, because the routines that we as humans can have and we carry every day in society. We're right. just like, that's how I hunt animals. I hunt and I, I bank on their routines. Right. That, if you take a, uh, any animal, I don't care what animal it is, you're looking for their routine. That's the number one thing you're doing when you're scouting. I am now on the other side. I'm the predator. Right. And when I do my scouting, I'm looking at their routines. I've already done my aerial. So there's my aerial. I, I've done my, you know, looked at different sectors and how, you know, to funnel, how to, you know, where the vulnerability points are. But right. now I need to know what's that routine so I can time it. And um, especially if I'm going after an individual or, or a group of people doing a certain thing and getting very specific. Right. 
So I rambled enough there, but uh, yeah. But it, what's interesting about what you just did it, you just talked exactly about how you should look at your life um, up close and personal. You know, this stadium and arena that I just arena that I just showed you. You know, you could drive by there and get a good look at um, where the groups are congregating at the end of an event or the beginning of an event. And then if you get out and you walk around, you'll get a good taste for um, the attitude and the awareness level of, of the population. This is, these are all tactics that bad guys use and that good guys should be using themselves to better understand their locations and where an attack can happen. But you have to look at it from an attacker's point of view. You can't just show up and say, um, you know, this is where uh, I see a group of people over there congregating. I'm not going to go over there. You need to understand, is that a one-off or is that the reality of where they go? And what best, what kind of attack could be happening? Is that the only place you can pick people up and drop them off? You know, that's what the attacker is going to look for. Um, and that's why you have to look at it from that perspective. Yeah, they actually have a lot of, uh, even here at the amphitheater, they have a section for pick up and drop off. And it's the same location for the kids. Yeah. You know, one spot, you know, that you, you pick up and drop off, pick up and drop off. And people are in line. And it's, you know, they do it to make it easier for people to find each other after an event. Right. The problem is, like you said, that's a easy way, especially let's just take a concert, for instance, say uh, Justin Bieber or whoever. And there's all these young girls waiting for their parents to pick them up. And, and as much as I hate to say it, it hurts me that, that we have to talk about this, but you, your daughter, you know, it always gets me that it doesn't matter. They're the most vulnerable I think the most vulnerable human on the planet is a young woman and, uh, and it can be abducted and assaulted and all kinds of crazy stuff happen. It's, it's less on a, on a, on a male, but more on a young female, but, or kidnapping kids that they're doing now with the uh, slave trade that's actually going on. And it's, it's the human trafficking. It's lit legitimately here in the United States. Mm -hmm. heaven. And nobody's really pushing it or talking about it. And every time somebody does, something happens to I'm a conspiracy, but it's it awfully doesn't, strange. It doesn't get traction. Yeah. And it's very odd that, that happens because some of the most powerful people in the world have information that would scare most people. But that's another story. My point is there's a huge vulnerability for moms and, and daughters and, and and them to be picked up at a certain area. So I'm glad you pointed that out. What do you do? You Sometimes the kids might not understand where you're going to meet them in a crowd. So what do you do? What's your recommendation? Well, first of all, you got to, again, you're looking at this from an attacker's point of view. We know that, um, that pedophiles, hold on one second here. I got my dog just fell down. Hold on. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So we'll give a break real quick. No, no, he's, I'm back. I'm back. All right. Stay on here, folks. Remember, share this. This is important information. And, uh, and this is crazy. We're getting this information. This is this is exactly what we want to do at Reaper Outdoors. And Jonathan Gilliam's giving it to us and uh, his show, The Experts. You know, he talks about that. And uh, let's just keep going. I'm trying to hit some buttons. Bam! All right, we're both back. This dog's 18 years old, so he t he tends to come over here and milk up to me and then fall down. So um, okay, so basically, when you look at, when you're looking uh, at a facility like this and you're trying to determine from a defensive point of view so how, what do I do? Where do I pick my kids up? If this is a big vulnerable area, this is a critical area, not a vulnerable area, critical area. And I know that they're going to be there at this critical time because this uh, concert's going on. And I know that within that critical time are, are heightened critical times, like at the end when everybody flows out. So what you have to do is you have to look at it from uh, an attacker's point of view and you have to say, okay, if, I was a terrorist. Where am I going to hit? I'm going to hit where I'm going to get the biggest bang for my buck. So I'm not really going to be interested in the back areas, most likely. If I'm a, a a pedophile or a pickpocket or a sexual predator of some kind, where am I going to where where am I going to go? Well, you might go out to the back in that case, but most likely you're still going to be drawn to the areas where the most people are because it's easier to manipulate a crowd uh, that is packed than it is. Uh, stragglers that are walking about and so what you would what I would determine is that it first off um, how hardened is this facility so 
And if people leave, can they get back in? You can find that out by trying it yourself when you go to a concert or by approaching security and asking them. Once you determine that, then you can come up with a tactic, for instance, where you tell your children, you don't leave that inside of that facility um, until you make comms with me via the phone and, uh, and I verify where I'm at to pick you up. And then, and that way they're on the phone with you constantly. Um, we have the ability to do this now, FaceTime, where people can be on the phone FaceTiming with their parents if they're a young enough child and you're able to vector them in a certain way. Another thing is, what about a lost child, Ron? I, when I was in the FBI, yeah. I was working the, um, the balloon inflation for the Macy's Day Parade, and there's half a million people there. And this little girl walks up and um, she goes, excuse me, are, are you a police officer? And I said, well, what's going on? And she just started crying. She said, I lost my parents. This girl's like seven years old. And I said, OK, that's OK. We're, we're going to get them. And so I said, do you know their do you know their phone number? And luckily she did. She had a phone. So uh, so we called them. But, you know, if you predetermine the fact that that could possibly happen, nobody ever thinks it could. But if you say, OK, this could happen, um, you tell the child, as soon as you're separated from me, you FaceTime me. And uh, and then I'm going to immediately answer that phone and I'm going to be able to identify where you're at and anybody that's around you. And you say, OK, you show me something that's there. I'm coming to you. Um, you can have your, you know, the, the thing on your phone that tells your location constantly with your children. The, the fact is, Ron. If you're not sure about. How a place could be attacked and who the threat is. You're not going to come up with adequate defenses and plans to to thwart those people. Um, and if you're not aware that any of this stuff can happen, you're never going to come up with a plan of attack. You know, I think ultimately people are always afraid that if uh, their child gets separated them from them, they're going to get snatched up by some bad guy. Um, and that and that very well could be. But uh, what if the kid walks out into the middle of the road and gets hit by a car? You know, these are things that. You have to look at, you have to think your way through and then teach your children based on the knowledge that you've gained before you get there. This is the people that you watch out for. These are the locations that you're the most careful in. And this is our plan if you get separated. That's great. If, if people did that, we wouldn't have lost kids. Well, uh, yeah, there's some simple steps with that. My kids learned this, uh, learned this at a young age. They thought I was crazy, but they knew it. Um, I always walk outside and say, which way is north? And they know that, you know, just had a fun. But after a while, they figure out, OK, that's a North Star. That's, you know, the sun rose here. It sets right. here. You know, raising the week. That's a very basic thing to do with your kids. But the other thing was have a rally point. You know, once you get there and you go through this door, right. a lot of people know what door they came in. The worst yep. possible, you know, safe in, safe out is, you know, tell your children, tell your wife, tell your friends. Hey, if everything goes to crap, here's where we're going to meet. Now, maybe it's not the door, but a young child, you want them to go to an area where they can be seen. Right. And, you know, go to a police officer, go to, a, you know, go to the nearest police officer, you know, and, you know, put your freaking, if they don't have a cell phone, give them a piece of paper with your cell phone number and put it in their pocket. Right. You know, at least they know that's in there, but tag your kid. The other thing is, you know, with, with going back with that, with young kids, have a chaperone. You know, there's always one soccer mom or one dad who's going to bite the bullet and go, ah, I'll go to this concert. I don't want to. Right. But guess what? They're there to just keep an eye on things, step back, let the kids be kids. And then if the kids are a little too old and they're in that weird age, you know, or they're going to do whatever they're going to do, make sure they're in a group. Right. And, uh, you know, and then hold them accountable. Hold them freaking accountable for, you know, leaving the venue early and getting in trouble. Don't let them get away with it, but that's parenting. And I mean, there's just some safety stuff. And this is what this book brings out. But you know what, you know, Ron, let me say this real quick. We're talking about young children and parents relationship with them. I've talked to churches who have, uh, who send uh, missionaries down to uh, Honduras, the most dangerous country in the world um, <laughs> yeah. every year. Right. Right. With no security plan. And they put them right. in bright shirts as though they were children on a, on a freaking, you know, some kind of uh, field trip. 
and uh, they take the same bus. They show up. They get off the airplanes with those shirts on that say who they are. They get on the yep. same bus as everybody else. They go to a location that has no security, and they do it year in and year out. Just well, they do the themselves same thing up there. Afghanistan and Iraq. Look at a Canadian family. Right. You know, hostage for how many years? And the wife was raped and everything else in the world because and that's one thing we had to deal with a lot over there was missionaries and people thinking that they're going to be protected. Uh, that's a different environment, man, and they don't have any protection at all. Right. You're actually not doing anybody any good. You're actually putting poor people in danger by doing that. So Now, one of the other yeah. reasons why I wanted to point this out, why I wrote um, Chapter 5 is a lot longer than Chapter 4. Chapter 5 is talking about on-site uh, surveillance uh, versus um, uh, remote surveillance in Chapter 4. I want people to realize, reading this, um, that this is why bad guys are going to get up close, and this is what they're looking for. Because, Ron, if I tell people to say, if they see something, to say something, and I don't tell them what to look for, they're not going to know what to say. If you read Chapter 5, you're going to understand what a person who's doing surveillance on a facility to attack it is going to be looking for. So you're going to be able to identify their behavior a lot easier. And then you'll be able to say something because you'll, you'll know that that person's uh, behavior is odd compared to the daily person that's here. And they're paying specific attention to this particular thing. I saw them come in through a door where it is a do not enter. So I know that automatically they're either being lazy or they're nefarious. So that's one of the reasons why I thought chapter five was important to expound upon a little bit more, because if you understand that this is the most critical area for an attacker, this is where the attacker is vulnerable because the, when they get close in to do their surveillance, that's where they can be spotted. And right. places like the Marriott uh, hotel uh, around the world who is continuously a target, this should be type of thing that they monitor very closely. Yeah. And also families uh, who have young kids because pedophiles are actually easy to spot if you know their, their typical behavior. And this is where, when they're trying to get close to the family, remember a pedophile <coughs> isn't like um, a terrorist where they go look at a stadium, they do a surveillance on it and then they leave and plan attack a, an, a, a pedophile. Same thing with a work workplace um, sexual predator they're going to do their homework over a period of time and try to move in closer and closer. And that's why it's important to see how these, uh, these behaviors are uh, shared amongst bad nefarious people. Yeah. So I highlighted the section here where it's a simple <laughs> statement that you had in here, which, you know, it's actually in uh, defense actions. It's under the Boston marathon is under the Boston marathon bombing, but, uh, right. They figured it all, in all the preceding case studies, lack of awareness was the single biggest con contributor to the attacks by the citizens unaware of possible threats and by the authorities yeah. unaware of massive gaps in their, their threat assessment, which, as you pointed out with, the, with that, was people watched those guys set backpacks down and walk away. That's kind of yeah, odd. Yeah. Who does that? They lost their legs. Especially this day and age, right? So. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, policemen had seen them acting kind of weird or, you know, security guys, whether they're policemen or not. And like you said, the finish line, the most vulnerable, congested place was never controlled. There was right. no bubble set up around that. There was no controls. Um, even though there was a secondary bomb, a second bomb that was down in another one that didn't go off, thank God. But there uh, two that did go off. There were two bombs that went off. There's two that yeah. went off. They had one that did. Right. right. So there, that's what I'm saying. There was a third one that didn't go off. Thank right. God. But it, uh, that had been even more casualties, but the idea that, you know, that they, those choke points weren't paid attention to by the, whoever's in charge of that period, you know, you can blame the Boston, Boston PD, the, the mayor, you can blame anybody you want, but whoever was in charge of that security, um, you know, the funding or whatever, it doesn't matter. Lives are worth way more than money. Right. But at the same time, that's a huge race. That's highly publicized. And, um, you know, the vulnerabilities really stuck out. But the key point, awareness. I actually wrote awareness at the bottom of the page because we're not talking about paranoia. We're talking about awareness here and how yeah. to be aware. 
look, you're, you don't lock your doors at night because you're paranoid. You lock them because you're aware that that is a potential entry point for a bad guy. Right. It's the same yeah. thing here. You don't secure the end of a, of a marathon because you're paranoid. You do it because you're aware. You don't sit there and look at a, a, bo- a, a bag that's been placed on the ground and somebody walked away and left it there. And you, you don't sit, you don't look at that bag and say something to law enforcement or tell everybody to get back because you're paranoid. You would do that because you're aware. Why you wouldn't say something is because you're paranoid of the way people think about you if you said something. Yep. Paranoia exactly. actually works against you. It does not work for you. So the uh, California shooters, oh, Burbank, or not Burbank, yep. California. San Bernardino. Burbank? San Bernardino. Yeah. People knew that they were up to no good. Right. People, I mean, a lot of people knew that that family was doing stuff and collecting stuff and doing things and pre- even bomb making. Right. But they didn't want to report it. And uh, thickening to think about because there's it's our it's partially that's our society nowadays too because if you do and because they're Muslim all you have to do is scream well that's because I'm Muslim it's racist um, or it's sexist our country's in a very bad spot right now for guys like you and me who would see something and do it but there's ways that it can be done it doesn't have to be done openly to a right. point where you're screaming at somebody it can be done is something like going up to a police officer or a security guy and saying, Hey, somebody just dropped the bomb right there. I'm just letting you know. And I think we should do something about that. Whatever. Make them aware of it, aware. And the people around that, you know, just say, Hey, I'd step back. Everybody's got to just shut this down. Don't know what it is. Right. And you're giving people the opportunity to make a decision. Um, and, you know, you can always call the, uh, the police and report something's wrong, so at least they can go check on it. At least you did what you could do. Um, and then I, I, you know, later on I circled some other stuff about Navy officer candidate school. <laughs> you know, teamwork. You talked about teamwork. Yep, yep. And uh, Cleo and friends in the uh, British island, uh, uh, the British Virgin Islands, and. Uh, and how, you know, you would walk to, in order to learn something, you'd walk in circles. Right. Right. When I was when in Australia school. school. So this leads me to, somebody asked a question, this kind of works up. So you know, we get a lot of these questions, but I want to get to them before we, we stop and get to the end here. But um, So one is speak to not looking like a victim. Um, and I know that kind of, it's, it's just a question I want to get out, out of the way. Um, if you could speak to uh, not looking like a victim, what effect does that have? That's more of a psychological thing, I think, for your predators. Um, yeah. In other words, in other words, it, like looking like the prey. Um, if you yeah. go somewhere, um, there's going to be. I mean, like when Cleo and her friends went to the British Virgin Islands, um, it was going to be difficult for them not to look like a tourist. Uh, you know because you're in a place where you've never been before. So you're, you know, you're kind of um, in awe of where you're at or you're, you're people make the mistake when they go on vacation of just dropping all their awareness and everything. They just want to just relax and not think about anything. That's when they're the most vulnerable. So I don't know in some of these places vacation wise, if it's possible to not look like a um, uh, prey or as a person said victim, but here's, I think a better example of that would be, in the story that I talk about the guy who got knocked out on the, the subway platform um, in the knockout game. And that guy um, rode that subway every day. It's a friend of a friend. I don't know. I've never met him, but, but my friend told me this story. This guy rode the train every day to and from work. He was at the same subway station every morning and had inadvertently, um, because he didn't want to be around the crowds and had nothing to do with security. He just would go all the way down to the very end of the platform where you can't go any further. And that's where he would stand. And uh, what happened was that when it was really packed, there would be groups of kids that would come through and they'd either pickpocket or in this case, uh, they were playing the knockout game and he was down there all by himself and they just walked up and just blasted him. And so he put himself in a vulnerable area uh, and, and made himself open to being more of a target because he didn't understand uh, the location he put himself in every day. And he was not 
it's not like he was standing there aware of what was going on around him. He was, uh, I think he had, he had his head buried in his phone when he got knocked out. So had the guy, he was exercising, not really caution. He just didn't want to be a part of the crowd. Um, you know, had he been not quite so isolated, but away from the main crowd, he would have been a little bit safer um, from that. But, but the point is, those, those people might have been able to knock him out regardless, um, no matter where he was, if he was still not aware of his surroundings. The fact is, if his phone wasn't up in his face when he was sitting there and he was aware of what's going on around him, he might have been able to see those people coming towards him and eyeballed them as he walked past them to get away. Yeah, he might not have been the victim since he wasn't paying attention. Right. So, uh, I'm going to say I, one thing on that. Uh, so, I'm awareness not, is how you keep from looking like a victim or like yeah. a prey. I'm not looking like a victim. And you go to a new spot. Um, one of the things that we would do in when we work down South America and all that stuff is exactly what uh, you said, Jonathan, was do a good study of the area, the right. cultures you know, the culture, the language, and then what you're going to do. And then the last bit of advice I give people a lot of times when they're going overseas, when you get into, when you fly to, let's say, it doesn't matter where it's at, let's say Jamaica or Colombia, or let's use Colombia for an example, as a prime place, beautiful, right. lush jungles, beautiful people, great cultures. There's a lot of stuff in Colombia that's just romantically and dramatically outstanding. But right. The problem is there's an underworld there that uh, just sucks the life out of the place, which is terrorism. The FARC, the ELN, they kidnap people, especially Americans and that, uh, people that come for money or work for good companies. That's a huge way of getting money. Um, that's pretty much the underworld. However, to not look like a victim um, when you go there, even your first time, is one, when you get there, Make sure your first day or two or whatever schedules are not full of a bunch of adventures and craziness. You've right. got to get to know the lay of your land. So do a good study beforehand. Do it like a bad guy would. You know, so, you know, don't be caught up in all those uh, areas where, you know, potentially bad things can happen. And then start expanding your horizon as you're there and get to know the culture and the land and everything else a little bit more. Then you won't look like such the terrorist. Right. Because we on vacation, oh, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. And you end up doing narrow focus on the task you're going to do from one to the other, but not paying attention to the transition periods. So I think that would work great for, you know, everybody. It's awareness, but at the same time, it's taking your time in there and not looking like a victim as far as, you know, don't be the victim, you know. Uh, you know, I'll often run and – I don't, you didn't teach me this, but uh, I learned yeah. this actually in STT, I think, is where I learned this, um, which is now SQT. But when, when a bad guy, like when we're told, we're, we're the bad guy to our enemies, I guess, but when we're crossing a road in enemy territory, we don't run across the road. We walk across the road because you don't want to look like you're up to something. And um, uh, that's important for us to remember is that if you project the image of, uh, of a victim by showing that you're not aware of your surroundings, you're more likely to be victimized. And, yeah. and, and so the same way that, um, that we're taught to walk um, and not look like uh, uh, somebody who is up to something, um, bad guys are looking for people uh, to show signs that they are open to attack. Right. Absolutely. So absolutely. people have to remember that. And then we have, uh, <laughs> so we have, uh, let's see here. Okay. Jeremiah's question. Uh, Jeremiah Alexander, top three ideas to keep yourself and family safe and prepared. Move to Alaska. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, <laughs> uh, the, the top three things to keep your sa family safe and prepared. First thing is um, increase your awareness, you know, whether it be through this book or exercising, you know, with your children, the what if game, what if this happens? What if you get lost, you know, and then yourself asking yourself the what if game, that's one thing. 
Um, I think um, is, you know, is I didn't mention this in this book, but exercise is very important. The more physically fit you are, the more likely you are to um, control your uh, your fear in a fight or flight situation. And then the, the third thing is um, self-defense, whether it be your kids taking uh, Taekwondo or the whole family taking Hagana. You know, these are these are ways that help you uh, deal with um, and forward think uh, scary situations. So whether or not you'll ever use that, you may or most likely you will not. But all these things, developing your awareness and and understanding, like by doing these techniques, understanding uh, your critical area, your critical assets, your critical areas and the critical times for those areas, the vulnerabilities that can be exploited in order to get to you and the attacker's avenue of approach. Once you understand that. Once you uh, not only get your mind physically fit, but yourself more physically fit, exercise in general will help that. And then uh, once you develop more of a, if you want to take martial arts or whatever you're going to do, um, some type of self-defense that's getting your mind into uh, the, the mindset, uh, your brain into the mindset, I'm, I'm going to act. I'm going to have a plan to act. Those are the best things that you can do overall to uh, make sure that you're safe in, in uh, a dangerous environment. I hope that answers Jer- Jeremiah's and everybody else's question. I know yeah. my son just ca- said something great, which was have con- contingency plans, you know? So look, well, that's what a plan, that's what these plans are. You know, we call them in the military and, and your son, you know, we'll call those contingency plans. Mm-hmm. Um, this, I, I left that word out because I didn't want the, um, another oh, acronym in there, but a backup plan. <laughs> yeah. Have a plan. Yeah, a plan, a contingency plan. When we in the in the SEAL teams, like uh, you know the the Osama bin Laden raid is a good example. They had already planned for that hell for a helicopter to crash. They planned for that. Yep. So they acted in a way that they'd already planned to act in the case that that happened. And so if you plan um, not only for to get your family out of an area. Um, safely, but if you plan that if this happens, I'm going to act this way uh, long before that is a contingency plan. And that's, you can plan these things. This is what's crazy about this, Ron. And, and this is the most important thing out of this book, is that this, you know, this isn't the best written book in the world. I'm not a, a scholar. Uh, I'm not somebody who's uh, I didn't major in literature. I majored in psychology and political science. But it, it's simple enough for people to understand how to look at their life from an attacker's point of view. But Ron, this is the most important thing. It can be done. People mm. can literally look at their lives and say, I know, and I, and, and I get criticized for pointing out in the book a couple of times, my background and my resume. And I'm not doing that because I, I need an ego boost. I'm doing it because again and again, I'm trying to make the point. I know more than you do as far as tech, not you, Ron, but more than most people. I know more than most people from a tactical perspective. I know more than most people from of how law enforcement works and how bad guys think. But I, in order to attack you, must gain the knowledge that you already have about yourself and your surroundings. Once I gain that knowledge, I am a, I, I am a force to be reckoned with. But until that point, you're actually more of a force than I am. Because you have the knowledge and I'm trying to gain to develop a target package. So just build it yourself. Build the target package. Use your knowledge. And uh, you will not be surprised when something happens and you'll be able to avoid almost 90, almost 100% of it. Yeah, your, your book does a great job, actually. You, you know, and the other thing is you have a lot of knowledge I don't have with your background. <laughs> you know, with the, the different sides with the agency or with the, uh, the bureau and also with the, uh, you know, air marshals. And in your experiences, you know, just living in New York, you got experiences I don't have. Totally and, uh, living here. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That is a big thing. Different environment. And uh, we talk about environments. So you've got to get the book. We're not going to get too much into this. But, uh, you know, you have a, a family tactical airport plan that you could, you know, reading through that, you know, uh, one of the steps that I, it's, uh, <coughs> I thought was great. And I'm, I'm not going to go through the steps because I want people to buy the book and read it. I want, 
you know, we can't, we're not reading the book to you. You got to buy the book and, and it goes through it a couple times. Um, so as soon as the attack is over, yeah, you know, you bring up a point where as soon as the attack, the attack is over, that you should already have pre-programmed in your phone, a group text message to those who are important to you. Um, and who need an information set, whatever that, that text is. So it reminded me of our family has a, you know, we call it the bell and text, whatever. And, uh, you know, and then today we had two people join in on that text that was unexpected and um, nobody really noticed it, but uh, it was good. They're really they're close family friends, good dudes. But, uh, you know, somebody pointed out, Hey, so they're now they're bellings, you know? And uh, so, really it'd be really easy for myself knowing that reading that part right that you know if i wanted my family to know that i was safe if something happened somewhere boom hey nothing happened to me i'm okay or right. you know i'm here or you know whatever information that needs to go out it's in one text it's it's able to go out and um so that's a great point you know is having a a plan like you have here and i want people to read that part i don't want to give it all up but I also want, uh, you know, that part right there about having a way to contact your closest people. Right. Right. And that let, way. Let me, let me tell you something. When I wrote that, um, I didn't do any any uh, grand like study of airports. I mean, I know a lot about airports because I was an air marshal and moving in and out of those so much. But the way I wrote that was I literally sat down. And I took on the persona of a person <coughs> and I just started writing it as though I had a family of three kids and, uh, and, and a wife and, um, and we were going on vacation and I just went through it exactly what I would do um, based on my knowledge of airports and, and all that, which I, I don't have any knowledge really much more than anybody else. I just looked at it from an attacker's point of view. And I, and I wrote that in one sitting, Ron. I just went boom, 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 boom. This is what I would do. And I went back and forth from the attacker defender mindset. And I, and so and I developed that attack and how it happened. And then I went back through it and I re-evaluated my uh, steps that I would take. And I maneuvered those to get it a little bit better so that the family could get through one way and this and that. And, um, and that was it. But all of it was based on my ability to think like an attacker and think like a defender and go back and forth. Yeah, that makes sense, man. It makes perfect sense. You did a great job with this book, though. <coughs> um, the last thing that I'm going to bring up is, uh, you know, at the end, you got put it all together. You got a conclusion, all that good stuff. But uh, you have one last prediction. Yeah. All yeah. Right? Uh, Times Square will be hit again. Yeah. And it's either going to be um, it's going to be I predict. It's going to be a truck attack followed by either a gun or a knife attack. It's going to be a bomb, which we've seen. Uh, most people don't realize there was a bomb that went off in 2008 at the recruiting station at 3 a.m. <coughs> I worked that investigation later on in 2010. They still haven't found the person that did it. Uh, and then the Faisal Shazad attack where there was a bomb placed right next to the Marriott. I was the second FBI agent there. And that bomb was still live when I inadvertently walked about a block from it. I mean, I literally could see it right there. <coughs> um, but I predict that New York's uh, New York city will suffer another major attack. It's probably going to be in times square uh, or it very well could be in times square. It's going to be um, uh, most likely it's going to be in the summertime and it's going to be on a weekend around between the hours of six and 10 when it's mostly uh, densely populated. And it's either going to be, like I said, a vehicle attack where they get out and and uh, subsequently carry out a knife or gun attack. It will be just simply a gun or knife attack, or they will have a, a, a bomb in a vehicle. There's no, they don't shut the traffic down there. Um, it gets extremely packed on the on the crossroads on the north and uh, and all the way through it. But on the north side there and the south side both. They're eating areas, outdoor areas, seating areas where they've made it into kind of like a, an outdoor um, uh, park like environment, but with a, a three lane road running right through the middle of it with, you know, um, cement trucks, buses, vans, taxi cabs, cars, you name it. 
driving straight through the middle of all of it. The potential is if the, the bomb that Faisal Shahzad attempted to set off was 250 pounds of explosives and he put it in a place that was so ideally located, even though he built a crap bomb and it failed to, uh, to detonate because he, he chose um, uh, just the wrong substance to use. Um, that was 250 pounds and it was probably surrounded by about 10,000 people in the vicinity within, within a block. So potentially he could have killed a low estimate, more people than died on 9-11. So imagine on, and coincidentally, he picked uh, Saturday at, uh, at around six o'clock. I had actually previously told one of my bosses that the Marriott location in Times Square was the particular area that I thought would be targeted because they seem to focus on Marriott's around the world. But imagine um, Timothy McVeigh put together a bomb using ammonium nitrate that, that was a 5,000 pound bomb. Right. If he had drove or if somebody drives a bomb that size at six o'clock in the afternoon on a summer night, summer evening, and they detonate a 5,000 pound bomb, they're potentially going to kill 20 to 50,000 people. It's that densely populated. Right. That's crazy. Crazy so, to think people so, can What's crazy is that they don't shut the traffic down. And, um, you know, I mean, look, some crazy guy earlier this year or is it the end of last year? He um, it wasn't a terrorist attack. So they say uh, he just ran his car straight into Times Square and he killed. It was between two and five people. I don't remember exactly how many, but right. uh, that was just half a block. He drove half a block. So imagine if a, a large truck just went crazy in there. Um, he could kill 100 people easily. And if it was a, uh, a bomb, you're looking at thousands. That's crazy. So the city of New York needs to get its act together. They need to stop with this nonsense of, you know, we're, uh, we're the most hardened city in the, in the world because I drove through there in a cab about a month ago I had it on my show and there was a, a, a vehicle with two guys um, you know whether they're not they were Middle Eastern I don't know but they were dark complected um, with their vehicle parked in the middle of Times Square traffic was having to go around and they had their blinkers on and nobody was making the move now that right. right now after there's been two bombings they, they should have been swarmed that car immediately with guns to get it out of there um, but that's not the way they roll. And so it's going to come back to bite them eventually. Well, right now, Jonathan, I'm putting your, uh, where to get your book audio and on Amazon. <coughs> and I have been asked by people, where can they get a signed copy? So that's a little bit more difficult right now. I got a thing going with GoFundMe. If people donate $50, I can uh, get a book to them. Um, it's auto actually they'll get the book in the mail and then they're going to get a, um, uh, a label that is autographed that they stick inside the book. Other than that, um, I think we're going to try to be down at the NRA show in Dallas yep. in May. And, yes. And then they can just monitor my page. I'm going to be going different places over the next couple of months, hopefully getting more speaking uh, gigs. <laughs> and, um, I'll be glad to, uh, uh, autograph a book at shot show. I was doing it for uh, $20. I'd autograph a book for a $20 donation, which goes to the show and my ability to uh, take the show on the road. Yeah. So uh, yeah, May, uh, it'd be May 4, May 4th to the 6th in Dallas, Texas. We're going to have Jonathan Gillen down there. So you're a member of the NRA. You're, you're coming down to the annual meeting. If you don't know about it, to stay with us. We're going to do it. We're going to be there. I'm a life member of NRA. And uh, all you do is join the NRA. You'll be a, a member per year. You can buy a lifetime membership. You get into the show for free. And then we're going to have Jonathan Gilliam there at some of the booths. And uh, he's going to be uh, talking to people and, uh, of course, signing and autographing books. So let me put it to this way, folks. You know, this, this, this book right here is uh, – has the potential to save way more lives than those who have been killed. So um, this could save your life. This could save your life. This could save your family's life. So 
get a couple copies, not just for you, get one for yourself, but uh, I've got this copy. And Jonathan, I need a couple more and I'm going to get them. Okay. But uh, I would love for my daughter to read this. I would love for my mom to read this. My brother, uh, Charlotte, and her, her daughter, who's out actually out in California going to college, because I think it'd be a great read for her. At think, least look at this. I think the sheriffs, the, the chiefs of police, the mayors, your congressmen, your senators, the president, everybody should have a copy of this book. I know, I know oh. people think, well, that's a bit egotistical of you, but look, it's a simple book, and people need to realize that, um, for instance, uh, these mayors that are telling again people to see if they see something, say something, they don't realize that people don't know what to look for. And so if the mayors have this book and they go through it, they're, they're going to know just as much as the chief of their, their, their police department. Yeah. Um, no, I, congressmen, I, I, senators, I think, uh, police, people. military. And, and I think everybody should read it. Honestly, if you're an American, you should read this book, but I think you should, schools should have it. If I was at a university, I, because that's where kids are, are vulnerable more so than ever in their life. They get away right. from home. They get to go out and they do, they lose their minds, right? I was one of them. Like, wow, this is awesome. <laughs> but to be aware and have that one time that somebody was aware, and my, if it saves one life, it's worth it. So if I'm at a university, I'm ahead of it. I'm like, dude, sheet no more. Okay, I want everybody in the class, you're going to read this book and you're going you're gonna to write a constructive, uh, you know, report on it, just real basic. And tell me how you were aware today. And that's all it would take, just that simple, to go, hey, I can apply this to my life right here on campus, to where they start promoting and pushing it out. And when they go to a concert, when they go to a, a party, when they go to a gathering, or even a rally, because there's a lot of rallies in college, there's a lot of people that come into these rallies have nothing to do with the university or the subject they're rallying about. And then they just, bam, they hit it and get violent and crazy. Yeah. You'll know what to do because you might have a great cause, but then you have a bunch of boneheads that come in to make it the violence of it. And that's a whole other story. Yeah, but look, but that's a perfect example. I mean, look at when uh, Donald Trump was going around the country campaigning and people would show up these rallies. They would exit with no clue that anything might happen. Right. And they would end up getting hurt. And if the people had done a target study and and, uh, a target package on the areas where they were going and who might be a threat to them, they could have worked together to get people out of there safely. And I'm appalled not only that the people don't do that, but that the law enforcement agencies don't do it either. It's just, Ron, you know as well as I do, this is very simple stuff. You just, you just have to look at something and say, I want to attack that place. I want to kill. I want to steal. I want to rob. I want, you know, whatever it is. And look at it from that perspective. And you are going to discover things about, uh, about that location that you might not have discovered before, and then you can mitigate it. If you're a cop, a chief of police, a mayor, or a civilian, and you go through your life and you get attacked, I can almost guarantee you that you could have avoided that attack had you done even a minimal amount of of, um, observations of the daily threats that face you. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm going to put up the uh, people are asking about where in Texas and uh, and I'm going to put that up. Hopefully this took. Um, boom. There it is. You know, I was looking on your Facebook page right now. I don't see you and I. I see Dave Bray from yesterday, but I don't see our uh, live. Are you looking on my personal one or on the repo? Yeah. One? Oh, your, oh, no, your personal one. Yeah. yeah, my personal one. I don't know what's going on. I tried to share it to it and some reason it pushed it. I don't know where it goes. Okay. So uh, we're actually on the Reaper one right now. Gotcha. So, uh, yeah, it's the K. Bailey Hutchinson Con- uh, Convention Center um, in Dallas. So it says May 3rd through 6th. Okay. So there's a little uh, – uh, why does it say 3 to 6? I got 4 to 6. Oh, the exhibit hall will be open 4 to 6. So the 3rd is when we all get there and – set up booths and all that stuff so okay but anyways folks it's actually the fourth through the sixth and the link i'm gonna gonna drop that link up there i'll drop that up so all the information is in here we'll post it up more and more uh man look at this technology huh it's crazy (laughs) it's crazy (laughs) and we we would actually be able to meet thousands of people in one night 
you and I just sitting here a couple hours having a conversation like we would anywhere else. You telling all your experience in your book and who, who would have thought, hey, that, what was it, 30 years ago, 25 years ago? Five years ago. No, when you first when we first met. Oh, when we first met. Oh, uh, no. You know what's interesting, Ron? Last week was twenty years since I was in Hell Week. Okay, so we've known each other over twenty years. Yeah, 20 we years. we met in nineteen ninety seven. There you go. So twenty one years, you and I have known each other. And who who would have thought when I first saw you that we'd be talking twenty one years later? Yeah. You with a book and all the media and social media and uh, mass media and the yeah. network stuff that you've done that we'd be doing this today. That you'd still have a full head of hair, and I wouldn't. Well, where's the famous <laughs> that? <laughs> well, my family doesn't have any. I don't know of anybody on either side that ever lost a strand of hair. So, well, you know, I was called two things when I was in the teams. It was either rabbi because I looked like I had a, a skin yarmulke on my head, or um, uh, Brian Olette used to call me Alf. I don't know why he called me Alf, but he used to, and that stuck. For oh, some really? Reason? Yeah. He called you Alf. Alf. You know the character that used to eat cats. Alf, the, uh, he was an alien. Yeah. He used yeah. to call me Alf. I used to call him Snaggletooth. Because <laughs> <laughs> Brian, Brian Olette can take his front teeth out. I don't know how they got knocked out, probably by a woman. but um, Probably by a woman or maybe a little bit too many drinks. That's one thing that boy could do is drink. And if oh, yeah. anybody out there is wondering who we're talking, Brian Olette was actually killed in Afghanistan. And we had Camp Olette that was named after him. But he was killed in Afghanistan from an IED. And it was a shame. I mean, he took the brunt of the hit, and it was horrible. But, uh, yeah. you know, what a guy. Um, he was a team guy that you could only break the glass in time of war and let him go, yeah. uh, literally. And, uh, you know, but he was a true American. So Irishman at that, too. He was pure Irish, man, just straight up whiskey. And and he looked like Tom Jones. Good. If you took Tom Jones and put him in a, in a freaking military uniform, yeah. that's what he looked like. He did. Absolutely. Yeah, I always used to think that. I should have called him that. <laughs> no matter what he said about me, he still looked like Tom Jones. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right, buddy. Listen, yeah, I hope everybody likes this book. And, um, again, you know, if you read it, give me an honest review. You can go on Amazon. Um, but do yourself a favor. Don't show up. If you're going to give me a one star, don't show up and say that uh, the book is repetitive or that I talk about my skill set too much. Uh, there's a reason why I do all that. And if you don't figure it out from reading this book and that's on you because you're, you're, those are the people that are looking for every answer to be given to them. And that's not why I wrote this book. I wrote it to empower you. That's you figure right. it out. I'm giving you the tools. You figure it out. Read it, study it, pay attention. It's going to save your life, man. It's going to make, yeah. actually it'll open your world up a little bit. It really will. Yeah. So, thanks, Jonathan. I appreciate it, brother. You got it, my friend. Uh, we got to get, get your book now. I got to go pack up anyway. I got to. We got to get you to write a book now on how to grow a beard and shave it. <laughs> hey, man, I had a trim today. Look, look at it. I see it. Once I shave tonight or tomorrow morning, I'll be all groomed up and ready to be business like. Yeah. And then by Friday, you'll look like uh, Sasquatch again. So it, you grow freaking, you grow a beard faster than I've ever seen anybody. Yeah. It grows pretty quick. It goes like this though. Poof. You know, so, but it was kind of, it was kind of funny. I went in to get it cut today and the lady nicked this area. Uh -oh. And so it's not as it was. So she's trying to get it all squared away. And finally, I'm like, it looks good. It looks good. I'm good. Um, Just it'll grow into the day anyway. I was going to lose beard. <laughs> but anyways, Jonathan, thank you, sir. Thank you so much for coming on. And I am going to order some more of these um, from you and I'll, I'll get them signed for some of the cats because, uh, you know, I'll probably spend a good chunk of money on you. But uh, if uh, you need anything from me, get a hold of me. You're welcome back here anytime. And, hey, if you need a guest on all that crazy stuff, I'm there for you. You got it. You got it. We need to do a show when we're at, at NRI. We didn't do a show together at SHOT Show, but SHOT Show is a freaking beast. So It is a beast. You got to actually schedule that. I got to schedule. My schedule next year will be a little bit better. I say that every year, but. Yeah. It will absolutely be better for sit down and doing stuff. And that's what I'm going to do at the uh, NBS show this week. I'll be doing that. So thanks, brother. I appreciate it. You got it, my friend. And thank you. Your 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 um, recommendation of this book is, um, I mean, that's it means a tremendous amount. You should, I hope you realize that. It means the world. Oh, it validates, it validates this book. Well, good. Because you get, if you want to write a book, you might as well start writing mine now. 
I'm on it. <laughs> All right. So, all right, brother. Thank you. All right. You got it. All right. So that was cool, folks. We had uh, Jonathan Gilliam on here, and it's 11 o'clock, which means I've been on here for three hours. We had a large number of people come in and just watch our show. So it should have hit thousands of people. I don't know how many people it actually hit, but we won't know until we're done. But I uh, really appreciate uh, all y'all uh, paying attention. And uh, if you're a first timer with Reaper Outdoors, hey, our show is like this. Well, I bring people in that helps you and brings awareness to charities, that brings awareness to veterans, first responders, and all over the country. So uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 8 o'clock. I'm going to try to do one tomorrow night at 8 o'clock from uh, – Dallas. Um, I'll definitely have a post out, at least from Dallas. NBS show, we're selling our ammunition. Boom. That's how I make my real money. And uh, I don't make my money from talking. Uh, she, this is how Jonathan makes his money. So make sure you guys support this man, a veteran, a uh, bureau man. I mean, he worked law enforcement and he was a Navy SEAL. You know, that's freaking awesome. So uh, he tells it like it is, which is in this book will save you. Sheep no more. So buy a couple of them. They're not that expensive. And it's uh, it's written so I can understand it, so I know you understand it. And it's something you can write a couple or read a couple times um, and still get something out of it. That's a rare thing. So y'all have a good night. Thank you all very much. And uh, just be aware. Reaper01, out.